Welcome to the heating lesson, lesson number 22 in our book. Let's look at page 271. As a home inspector, you will have to visually inspect the heating system of the house. The heating system's inspection is defined with this lesson, although not all items covered in this lesson are discussed in other lessons within the course because the heating system uh, is um, general. It goes throughout the house. There's other things that we have to look at uh, that can be used as heat. But what we want to talk about today is central heating systems. We'll touch on area heating systems with electric space heaters and and gas base heaters in apartment buildings. Uh, let's first look through the uh, standards of practice. Uh, number one, describe the type of fuel heating equipment and heating distribution system. So I have to identify the fuel. How it, how it is fired. It's going to be either gas oil or electric. Operate the system using a thermostat. Typically the thermostats are on the wall. The only time it's not on the wall is if you have electric baseboard and the thermostat or on off control which will set the temperature is on the electric baseboard. Open, readily accessible and operable uh, uh, access panels provided by the manufacturer or installed for routine homeowner maintenance. I've always loved that. It says open it. It doesn't say inspect it. It doesn't say look inside. Just open the panel. I don't know. Observe and report on the condition of normally operated controls and components of the system. So, a heating system is literally uh, evaluate. We evaluate, not the specialists, they repair, evaluate uh, condition. This is literally all we have to do. Can anybody, does anybody in this room not know how to identify the difference between a furnace and a boiler? No, okay. Furnaces are forced hot air going through the house. You're going to have ductwork. Boilers are forced hot water and you're going to have pipes. So when you walk up to a unit, you either have coming out of the top ductwork or you have coming out of the top water pipes. That's it. That's not brain surgery. I have to identify the fuel and I have to identify the type of system it is and I have to operate the system. And how do we operate a system? Turn on the thermostat. Isn't that the homeowner's control? There's one additional thing that we should do, because you could make an argument, and I do, that the home motor control is also the, the safety switch over the unit. Correct? Most, uh, most systems, 70% have uh, shut off, and that's typically for your, uh, um, for your service guy, so he can shut it down. And uh, other than that, the only other control that would be on there would be a breaker on the panel. The breaker on the panel is not a homeowner control. The safety switch is. So when we inspect a unit, any kind of system, I'm going to identify the type of system. It's a furnace or a boiler. I'm going to identify the fuel that it's being used to fire up. I'm going to turn on the thermostat. What happens if I turn on the thermostat and nothing happens? you got to make sure the door is on because there's a safety switch on the front door as well. Correct. And that is a, a, a panel that we do, the homeowner can't take on and off. And this says we should take the panel on and off. But that's becoming less and less necessary because most of the systems that are certainly being installed these days and for the last 10 years are sealed and they're screwed on, on the high efficiency units anyway. So we're not really going to uh, mess with the panels at that time. But the, um, the only other thing is the master switch. So if it doesn't operate when I turn the thermostat all the way up to 90, then, it's, um, uh, then it, 
at that level, it's not operating. The only other thing I'm going to do is sometimes that master uh, uh, switch, safety switch, we'll call it, is, um, is been labeled in the wrong position or in the wrong position. So no matter what it says, turn it in the opposite direction. If it's up, pull it down. If it's down, move it up. If it still doesn't fire up, what do we do then? Do we go to the electric panel? No. Well, I'm going to go to the electric panel. Well, you can, but maybe not. I'm not going to go to it and see that it's on or off. I'm not going to touch it because yeah. it's not a control, and I don't know why it's been moved to the off position. I'm going to go to it and then verify that it's in the on position, it didn't operate with the on-off emergency switch, and it didn't operate to the thermostat. That, my inspection is over other than reporting on the condition of the unit. Rusty, uh, loose components, etc. But other than that, my inspection's over. I do recommend at some point in time you're buying a carbon monoxide meter to put on the unit so that you can determine when it's running if there's any kind of casual carbon monoxide leak generated from that unit. That carbon monoxide meter will uh, tell you if during operation, if there's carbon monoxide leaking in to the house. It should be going out the flue. Anything more than one part per million isn't the way it was designed. They're not designed to leak a certain amount and stop there. They're designed to leak nothing. Don't let anybody tell you that it's okay that it's only three parts per million. That, well, you can let the specialist tell you that, but you can inform your client that that's just BS. It's not, it's, it's not the way it was designed. It needs to be addressed. Once it's in the hands of the uh, heating and cooling guy, you're out of the loop. There's a hundred different reasons why there could be a leak. But I feel we have a responsibility to determine if there's any kind of leak. Let's read through the standards of practice, and you're going to see that um, we don't have to do that, but I think it is incumbent on you to do it. So we're going to observe and report on invisible flues, dampers, related components for functional operation. We're going to observe and report on the presence, condition, and the number of heat sources in each habitable space of a residential building. I've seen houses that have had oil, fuel, and electric, and wood fires. I mean, it was built over time, an old farmhouse, and it had multiple different units because they just kept expanding. Electric baseboard for the, the new addition that they put on the left side of the house, and then 15, 20 years later, somebody else moved in and they put an addition on the other side of the house, and they decided they wanted an upstairs above it, so they, they, uh, put, in, uh, they put in a furnace. So literally, boiler from the old house, electric baseboard for one addition, and then they just went with a new furnace and the other. They didn't take the furnace, they make it run through the whole house, because now they'd have to run ductwork. People don't like to do that, and it gets expensive. So each new addition would have its own heating system. So you get to one of these old houses, make sure you're paying attention when you're in the rooms to how those houses are heated. You can see radiators in some rooms and furnaces in another. An important part of the heating system inspection is prior to getting to it, if you're following our protocol and doing the interior before you're going down to the basement, you could be walking by a lot of different signs of the different types of heating systems. I, I, I missed, I remember early on in my career, I had a whole top floor that wasn't heated. And when I went downstairs, there was radiators. And then when I went down to the basement, there was a boiler. I turned on the boiler, on the thermostat on the first floor. I went down to the basement, saw that it fired up, put my gas meter on it, and went back upstairs a few minutes later, and the radiators were hot. My inspection was done. I just didn't pay attention to my heating system on the top floor. That's significant when you're talking about one of these old houses. Okay. So don't make that mistake. When you're in a house, always look at, and it wouldn't hurt to take your uh, checklist and maybe on the general interior, ask the question, uh, type of heat, because you're going to see ductwork, or you're going to see radiators, or you're going to see electric baseboard, and then you want to know whether it's on the first floor or the second floor. Now, do I need to worry about that on a house less than 20 years old or 30 years old? No. 
But how often do we do you think we're going to get into an old house that's 80 years old or 90 years old or 120 years old or like I had, oh, like the house that we had for a mock three months ago where it was at the a revolutionary house. Well, what town was that in, Joe? Oh, which one? I'm sorry. Uh, the revolutionary house. Cambridge. That was the Cambridge inspection. Yep. My, my dream mock inspection. God, I can't wait to go back. I we go back any time you want. I know, but some of this group's been there. We have to wait until it's a complete January. January. Yeah. Well, tell him we'll be there. Snow, snow or no, we're going. It's going to be cold there, too. I don't care. I love that. I'll just go down to the basement. We should put video down there. Just make sure nobody falls in that open. Well, well so we only lost one person at the last Yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Well, one out of 17. I'll take those. I'll take that loss. <laughs> you play poker with this guy? <laughs> you count the cards. <laughs> Home inspectors are not required to activate or operate heating systems that do not respond to the thermostat or have been shut down. If they are already shut down when you're there and that a, a, a breaker is off, leave it the hell alone. Okay? Now, you can if you want to. I've got heating and cooling guys come through this program all the time that their comfort level is those kind of units. That's their, that's their thing, and that's how they market themselves. So it would be incumbent upon them to use their expertise from a marketing strategy standpoint. Realtors like that. Realtors don't mind having a tradesman there at the house. Just don't, don't take your handy, the fact that you're handy and you, do, you take care of your own house, and don't lead that into a specialty and, and then go beyond their SOPs. If you're going to go beyond your SOPs, please, please stay within your own profession if you came from that. But I don't mind roofers that want to walk the roofs, but any, any one of you that, other than a roofer walking the roof, you're crazy. And the same way with heating and cooling guy, and the same way with the electrician. If the electrician wants to tear apart that panel and get inside it and look behind the, the breakers to see if there's rust, have at it. That's his, that's his forte, that's his specialty, and he's also um, knows what he's talking about, and that's how he markets his business. I know one guy's a roofer, and, he, and his, a part of his advertising routine is I walk every roof, even in the winter. I'd like to see that, but he ad he yeah. uh, he advertises it, and that's how one of the ways he gets business. I don't have a problem with that. It's not prohibited. It's just not required to walk the road. Um, number uh, number uh, on the next page, uh, two seventy two. Uh, number eight, evaluate the type of material contained, contained in insulation and wrapping of pipes, ducts, jackets, and boilers. Notice this is in the area of home inspectors are not required to. You're going to be asked about asbestos wrapping on these boiler pipes. And what are you going to say? I'm going to note it and if it's fireable or not. Well, go back some. How are you going to identify that wrap? As being asbestos? As like being asbestos like. like. Because some of those do not contain asbestos. Noted, an asbestos like material insulating the panels. Um, uh, uh, several locations were friable because that's the danger. Regular asbestos is everywhere we look. I can guarantee you there's asbestos in these tablecloths. I can guarantee you there's asbestos in the, the wallpaper. It's everywhere. It's just not manufactured in the United States. But we have asbestos in all, in anything that's not glass, wood, or steel. It could, could have asbestos in it. And with that said, that insulation wrap could have asbestos in it. And then if it's friable, we know that friable asbestos is the dangerous asbestos, and non-friable is the non-dangerous. So if you have perfectly insu uh, perfect insulation on all those water pipes, and they are as uh, asbestos-like, and there's no friable, all you're going to report on is, you may want to go with the extra step and say non-friable, or no friable locations noted. 
if you got nothing else to talk to about on your report. But it's when you have the friable. And friable, the definition of friable is uh, tattered, broken, that you can touch it and the, then the flakes will all be in the air. If it's tight and there's no tattered edges or anything else, it's not friable. And non-friable asbestos is not a danger. The industry, the Department of Labor, um, only is concerned with friable asbestos. Okay? So if it's a tattered edges on those boiler pipes, then you're going to address it as a, a mold, a mold plate. An asbestos-like material is used as insulation, noted several friable locations. You're going to put two pictures of friable locations and recommend qualified contractor um, run further tests to determine whether it's asbestos or not. And your client may or may not want to do that. But at least you have warned them about it. Uh, home inspectors are not required to test for gas leaks or carbon monoxide. It doesn't mean you're prohibited from it. So I think it's uh, for the uh, cost of $170 that you're going to be able to use on every inspection. Are you kidding me? That's nothing compared to the safety that it may bring to a family. So uh, uh, make, make that carbon monoxide of, of meter a, uh, an expense. Uh, it will pay for itself. I, I, trust me, if nothing else, it will pay for yourself in marketing. It will pay for yourself because, uh, unfortunately, most home inspectors do not do this. They'll do a lot of different things, but this is a basic. Uh, I would not want to defend not testing for carbon monoxide from an, an attorney that gets in my face and says, you've been in the business for 15 years, you've done all these inspections, and you don't you didn't spend $170 on a simple test that doesn't take any of your time other than turning it on. I don't think I could, I don't think I could make a, a, an intelligent argument other than the fact that it says I don't have to. And that's a pretty weak argument. And then tell me, trust me, if, a, if people die, you're going to wind up in court. It's that simple. Now, people don't die in this very often. We hear about every case. And when's the, last, the last time I heard about a case of somebody dying of carbon monoxide in the area, it's uh, an old couple that got home late at night at or after an anniversary party. They uh, got out of the car. They left the car running. They went in the house. The door wasn't self-closing. It happened a year and a half ago here in Albany. And, uh, and by the morning, they were dead because the house filled up with carbon monoxide. But how often do you ever hear from it because a, a, a furnace didn't operate properly? I don't recall a story in my 15 years about a furnace killing people. I've known a lot of people that were close, but never actually killed. Got sick. Uh, my cousin down in Pennsylvania, she went to sleep with her husband and their three kids, and there was a leak during the night, and for some, for some odd reason, something woke them up, and they barely made it out. <clears throat> so, to, to spend $170, that improves your marketing, improves the quality of your inspection, and you get to use every inspection? Wow. I think that's a win-win. Helps your marketing and saves lives. Well, of course, we don't have to evaluate the capacity, adequacy, or efficiency of a heating and cooling system. Your client's always going to say, well, this house has been remodeled a couple times. Is this furnace uh, going to be big enough to heat that whole house? And it's a good question. But it's not our job to measure capacity. What you can do is turn it on and let it run for a half hour if it hasn't been on and go up into the far bedroom and see if there's heat coming out. <clears throat> I don't have to measure capacity to see if it's effective. The same way with air conditioning. I don't have to measure the capacity to go to say, turn it on, turn it all the way down below, get that sucker blowing through the house, put it down at 50 degrees, let that air conditioner blow through the house. It doesn't have to chill the room all you do is put your hand down next to the grate, and if it feels cold, it's working. There is no test like there is a carbon monoxide test for air conditioning efficiency. Literally, I've had specialists that come in and did continuing education with us that says the most effective way to check AC is to put your hand in front of the grate. And if you feel cool, 
it's cool, and it'll take care of the house. And that's a guy that has his hands on any equipment he wants to, and he still says, all I do is feel it. I know it's working, and it's working well enough if I can feel cool air. So we do not have to evaluate the capacity, and you will be asked to evaluate the capacity on air conditioning systems and heating systems. Observe and report on in-floor and ceiling radiant heating systems. You're going to run into radiant. We're not going to talk much about radiant other than the fact that it heats the floors. There's no real way to determine how effective it is. When you go downstairs on this boiler system, you're going to see radiant pipes installed on the wall with the distribution with PEX, and that PEX is going to run to all these pipes. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at the condition of those pipes. There's nothing much else to do. The house, you're not going to be, now, uh, I have been told by my heating and cooling guy when I came out of an inspection, I called him up and says, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? And he says, one of the pipes going to those, from the PEX, it's going to go into a main that then distributes it through uh, the rest of the piping that goes through the rest of the house. Feel that. If it feels warm, there's nothing else you can do. So, the first time you run into PEC, uh, a radiant system, Find the control box, and, and you will see it, because typically it's going to be, I'm sure you've, the realtors have seen it before when you've gone into a house, right? It's PEX lines coming in to a distribution <coughs> of pipes going out, and one of these pipes here is going to be hot. You're not going to feel it on these over here. So go in and feel. Once it's on, feel if the pipe's warm. That's, that's what the heating and cooling guy said is the only thing we really can do with it. Okay, the type of systems we're going to talk about quickly, because as you can see, there's not much that we have to say. We don't have to be able to tell them how it operates and what all the uh, significant components are. We need to be able to identify the type of the system, the type of fuel it's using, and operate the system, and that's it. And, and check for carbon monoxide and look at the condition. But let's talk about the individual units. Forced hot air, page 273. There you see the heat exchanger in the middle. The blower is below it, and up on top is the ductwork. And notice on the left side, the rear of it, that's the return air. After you've done a few of these inspections, you'll start seeing the pattern of where the pipes are, etc. Now this is a gas-filled, uh, gas-run system. You see the gas uh, uh, supply line coming in um, in the middle of the unit and that puts the gas across those bur the burner. And the burner then uh, is heating the air that's being blown from the, uh, burn uh, from the blower up into the distribution and it's passing through the heat exchanger and that air is being warmed. That uh, gas line, that blower pushes it through the house that then pushes it into the room and that pushing it into the room forces the cold air out of the room and down the return and it's creating this arc of the hot air rising up into the room pushing the cold air down because it wants to naturally sink into the return. Now a forced air system is going to have the supply under the windows and on the outside wall and in the middle of the room is going to be a return. So typically, the heat's on the outside of the wall, like these units here, and it's going to, but these are, these are just AC, um, so it's not a good example, but the heat's going to come up into the room, and as it sinks and as more hot air comes up, it's displacing the heavier air, which is going to go down the return and come back into the furnace and to be reheated. So it's the circular effect. <coughs> Uh, you do want to go after it's operating and after the furnace has been working for five or six minutes. It would not hurt you to take a walk around the house and to make sure you have heating uh, supplies in every room. Or are they just on the first floor or are they just on the second floor? It's very simple to walk in the room and find the ducts. And you'll see in the middle of the room or in the hallway, 
uh, outside of the you're going to see um, um, returns where that cold air sinks into that return. So if you see a vent in the middle of the room, that tells you it's a return. And if you see a vent on an exterior wall, that's going to tell you it's a supply. So by the location of the vent, you're going to know whether hot air should be coming out of it or cold air should be going into it, by right? literally the location. There are alternatives to that. I remember an early inspection, first time I ever call, got called out for not telling somebody my client called and she wasn't happy. Because, and I hadn't recognized it, but I talked my way out of it. Um, she didn't recognize the fact that this old farmhouse didn't have any ductwork or vents going into the upstairs. All it was was one of these old, uh, old houses that had in the middle of the hallway upstairs on this 110 year old house was the grate in the middle of the floor and hot air was forced up through it. That was it. There was no return. It's just hot, hot air was put in the top of the house or the first floor and then through the top of the house because hot air is going to rise. So it was pushed into the first floor and then rose into the second floor. And I was too stupid and too young at 56 to know that what the, anything about the system. And she called up and I knew a little about it. And she said, there's no heat ducts in the bedrooms. All there is is the grate in the middle of the room, in the living room, and then a grate on the top floor. And I said to her, well, that's the, the heat is being generated from the furnace, and that air is being pushed into the lower floor, and it rises naturally into the second floor, and that, that heats the house. And she says, how do you know? And I says, because it's been operating that way for 100 years. Nobody's frozen to death in that house. But how, how could I be comfortable that that's going to heat the house? And I said, I assure you that if that furnace is working right, that it will heat the house. And I'll assure you to the extent that if you can come to me after this winter and you tell me that house isn't warm, because it was too small a house, and it was just one, one square, two floors, maybe 1,400 square foot. I'm sorry, you get a furnace that's properly operating, that house is going to be warmer than shit. And I said, you, and if you're cold, I, I will pay you for a new furnace. And she says, oh, you will? Put that in an email. And I did. And I sent it to her. That's how stupid I was at the time. Because I was sure that that system was going to work. And it's been 15 years later and she hasn't collected on that debt. So it does work. It's just an older system. That's all. So when you're upstairs doing your inspection, look at what your distribution system is. Is it a, a pipes going to uh, radiators? Is it vents that bring a supply into the house? Uh, the air up into the upper rooms, or is one floor not not heated, but another floor is? That's not unusual to find a second floor not heated. Uh, some of the older houses, they just heated the bottom floor, and they hoped that the heat that uh, that heat uh, matriculated upstairs. I believe the Cambridge home was like that too. But the the second, second floor was just just openings. I didn't. Inspected, yeah. so I didn't notice that, but it wouldn't yeah, surprise me. Just yeah. openings for the just air openings to, for to move upward. Yeah. Of course, people back then dressed a lot warmer than we. Well, the rooms are smaller. Yeah, smaller, different build. That yeah, absolutely. So, how would you handle um, the same situation? That the first floor was renovated and they covered over those grates. How would you report that? Would that be a defect, or that just be a comment? Now, uh, let's just say that some idiot went in there and was flipping a house and he put down floors and he said, oh, they don't need these grates. But it didn't occur to him that those grates were a central heating system. Is that what you're yes. suggesting? Yeah. I'd say there's no heating system on the first or second floor. House, house has a furnace and no visible heating, uh, heating supply pipes in the upstairs. <coughs> but you wouldn't, because call, it, you wouldn't question, call it a defect, though. I, I would. Uh, not having a heating system in a house, every house is supposed to have a central heating system, or not central, every sp house is supposed to have a heating system. And I am supposed to inspect a heating system. And if I do not see any way to get it out of the basement, 
it's not doing the other fours. I'm going to report it as a defect that there are no heat supplies on the first or the second floor. I'm not there to tell them that it's why that they covered up the grates, and if they did cover up the grates with, uh, let's say, tile. Yeah. Well, the example, like, I have a specific example. Obviously, <laughs> you didn't, because you didn't come out by the question. That's not a general question. Yeah, no, You've it's, seen it's, that it's happen a, before. It's yeah. it's a, the second floor is, is the registers on the floor are blocked. So the only heat on the second floor of uh, three bedrooms and a bath is uh, electric baseboard in the bathroom. And the first floor did have the hole in the middle of the room. You can see the grates in, on the second floor, but it's no, no, on wanted. the first floor. Uh, was there the grates? Floor, sorry, the, was there grates bringing the heat up to the first floor? There was, but the sheetrock over is in the first floor ceiling, so you can only see you can see the grates on the second floor floor, but but it's been they, they the really ceiling see. covered up the ceiling covered up the air passage. Oh, well, then I'm a, but that's not the way the system was designed. It, I, I don't have to be an engineer to know that now there's no path for the heating system to get it up to the, so I'm going to call that. Now that is, I would, if the house was designed with no grate, I'd have a hard time calling it out. Yeah, so if, the, if you didn't see the grate, then you, then you would say, I don't know, you make make a comment. Maybe make a comment. But this house uh, doesn't appear to have any heat source on the second floor. Uh, but the problem is, in those houses, they expected if you heat up the first floor, it's naturally going to heat up the second floor. The second floor in those ages, were uh, that was just your sleeping quarters, and you go to bed with a pair of flannels on and you know, when in the cold season, and, and you have a couple of extra blankets. Maybe you don't mind it getting down to 50 degrees in, uh, in the house. 50. I grew up in one of those houses. I used to have ice in, in the water glass next to my bed when I woke up in the morning. It you keeps your mind sharp. Sure. That's probably <laughs> well, what happened. Uh, <laughs> What's the difference between like what we're talking about with the grate that is in, on the ceiling of the first floor that goes to the second floor and the staircase? Yeah, it does come up to staircase too. But... Hold on, I'm thinking. Um, um, okay, uh, the, the systems were designed, systems were designed either with ductwork or to be brought up the center of the house. That I know from the experience of seeing those older systems, and it's always a great in the middle of the house. I'm going to make a comment that this is a non-standard distribution of heat that they're using a stairway, uh, that, which would obviously be on the maybe on a wall of the house, because those houses back then for this type are boxier and square, if you know what I mean. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to call it out not as a defect, because obviously he can get up there, but it's not a non-standard method of heating the second floor, and recommend then a qualified contractor evaluate. Now I want the specialist to evaluate. Uh, this is a perfect example of now I'm calling. I don't want them to call out something I know is broken. And this is a, clearly the difference. So all of you that we talk about, if you know it's broken, don't have somebody come in and evaluate it. But if you don't know that that system won't work properly, now you want the specialist to come in and evaluate because it's beyond, in terms of an engineering point of view, and a thermodynamic point of view, it's beyond my uh, level of, of knowledge. Do we all, and this is an important example, and thank you very much for the question. This is an important example of, of between what I know is broken and what I don't know is broken. What I know is broken, I don't want somebody to come in and evaluate. What I don't know is broken, I want the specialist to come in and evaluate. So this is an example of how to use or not use the evaluate word. Thank you, you covered two points there. But I don't think I can call it defective because I don't know that that's not the way they, that that guy designed to heat the oven. But I want to protect my client. And so uh, urging my client to get a specialist in to see if that's going to work in this house, basically I'm punting. I'm going to punt it to them. Okay? Got it. Did that do it? I think so. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? You didn't think furnace would really take a 30 minute lesson, did you?
That's what always surprised me when I got into this. I thought this was going to be the hardest material to cover is heating systems in homes. And it's literally one of the easiest. Of course, hot water. Everything we said about the air, we can say about the water. Cold, uh, hot pipes going up to radiators, heating radiators in the room. The cold water is then forced back down to the boiler, and the boiler heats the water up, and, uh, and a circulator sends it back upstairs. There's not one word that I said about a furnace that can't be used about the boiler. And this is why they call them central systems. I have, uh, I have a house with a couple of different floors with a down in the basement, a system here that's heating centrally all the different rooms in the house. As compared to a house that has a heating system that each room or hallway has their own individual heating systems. This, these are space heaters, compare or uh, area heaters, space heaters area. Each of these heat the space that they're in, and this is a central system. And that's a part of, di uh, of describing the type of system we're dealing with. Okay, so we're going to have central systems, which are furnaces and boilers, and then we're going to have space heaters, which are electric baseboard, gas space heaters that you'll find in apartments in Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. You walk up into the apartment, and there in the middle of the room is a big gas space heater with, that you, where, is where the old fireplace used to be. The gas space heater is in front of it, and the gas line comes up to it, and the on button is on the side of it. You turn it up, it's a thermostat, and bang, you got heat. You walk into the kitchen of this three-bedroom, second-floor apartment, and you're going to see a gas on gas, are they called, those stoves, or heat on heat? Gas on gas. Gas on gas stoves that people are now paying thousands of dollars to get them for their apartments. Because in most municipalities, you need, in those kind of apartments, you need two heat sources. So they'll have the gas on gas in the kitchen, and it both, it has a vent pipe out, and it generates a heat for the kitchen area by, by their local building codes. You know, I'm saying a word I'm not supposed to. Their local building codes ask for two sources of heat. So here in the living room, you have a gas space heater that's heating the living room. And in the kitchen, I have a gas on gas, and that qualifies as heat. So you need to know the difference between just space heaters, which is a system, just not a central system, and central systems, which is furnaces and boilers. Baseboards and radiators. Baseboard convectors. If you go into my house when you did a mock, you saw baseboard convectors around on the floor, and there are metal panels that are covering coiling that water goes through and heats that room, and it's being sent to it by the, uh, by the radiator that has a return sending back the cold. And, uh, uh, or the house could have older, in years ago, they used radiators. There's no difference in that. I don't know, that there is radiators that just take an input and there's no line back to the boiler. I don't get involved with that, that's too much technical. I turn it on and the radiator's either hot or it's not, I'm done. I don't have to identify <coughs> what age or engineering requirements were for that unit. And I don't bother with it and it's never bothered me, nobody's ever asked. So you either have radiators or baseboard convectors. You turn on the boiler, you walk around and you feel the radiators or if you have one of the uh, heat guns, that'll tell you the temperature, temperature guns. You just walk around after you have it on and uh, check the heat on each of those uh, baseboard convectors. Well, how do you report if one of those convectors is off and you're getting no heat from it? What would you do, William? William. Oh, I just thought you said Gwen. <laughs> I know, Gwen, you're not going to. <laughs> 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 
just not working. Um, if what, just one wasn't working? One wasn't working, and you walk around the system, one's not working. Just report it and say it needs to be repaired. Repaired? Uh, I've always questioned whether it's a repair or did somebody shut it off because that room was too warm. And I think that's the question. Yeah, so you play it by ear. Uh, it depends on the age of the house, depends on the condition of the system. I don't know too many. I think there's more likely that they shut it down, that convector, because it was too warm. What about if the, uh, what about the system zone, too, when you kick on that? Uh, well, then you're going to have more than one. They don't zone one. But I'm just saying, you, you may end up you know, not having any heat on the second floor. Okay. But the one thing the about zone systems, each zone has its own thermostat. Right. So if you went, so now you get involved in zoning and you have to do this with heat and with boiler. Thank you for bringing up the zoning. You actually literally have to turn them all off, turn one on and go check to see where it's at and if it's heating correctly. And then you shut that one down and turn the other one on and then go check where that one's affected. I don't do that very often. But I would just love to have zoning in my house. I Oh, it, it, it's a personal matter. Huh? Well, it's it, it's an expensive, it's an expensive option. Oh yes, it is. If it hasn't been zoned, there's a lot of repiping that has to go on. It's not cheap. There's no no going to one spot and just putting in a. Well, actually, there is, but it's kind of complicated. But you don't have to run all new pipes, and you can do it just from the basement. But it's it's not cheap either way. If you go into a house and you find one radiator cold while all the rest are hot. If you see a valve on the bottom of the radiator, you oh, oh, oh. You don't ask me, do you, I touch that valve? I'm asking you. Uh, no, don't. <laughs> Just don't. What do you think? Seriously. I say you don't. Okay, good. Good. You never touch a valve. Maybe all in it. Under no circumstances touch a valve. There is absolutely no reason to touch a valve. Only bad things come from touching a valve. Can I make that any clearer? All is going to happen. I guarantee you, you touch your first freaking valve. I, t I guarantee you it's going to start squirting water everywhere. Okay, you'll be buying them a new heating system. Okay, don't do it, period. We do not go in and operate valves of any kind. If you do it, you're, you know, you're just playing with fire. Okay? That's, that's somebody handing you a hand grenade, and you're hoping it's just a smoke grenade. Hope's not going to get you anywhere. Don't do it. Um, so you see a valve, uh, and it's not, uh, uh, and that radiator is not hot, and it could have been turned off. I, I don't know radiators well enough to, to know what the on-off position is on a radiator. We all know what the gas valves look like that are off there across the pipe and on they go with the pipe. So if you have a pipe that has one of these valves, does that look okay? That's a valve. That's off. And then if that valve is down in this way and was turned in this manner, now that's on. Water is flowing with it. I don't know what that valve would look like. I mean, if it looks like it's off, you could report it, and the client says to you, what I would suggest you do is warn them that we don't know how long it's been, we don't know if we may be causing a leak, but if anybody wants to here, I'm sure the realtor would love to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Just let the realtor do it. I don't know. Huh? No. When in doubt, throw him in. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, well, actually, not in when in doubt, at every opportunity, throw the realtor in. Is allowed banging in a radiator system a defect? Uh, that's yeah, just that it hasn't your... been bled. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's defective. If it is banging, explain it to the client and tell them they, should, they may want to have it serviced. Because that's literally just air in those pipes. It doesn't say that the system isn't running. It actually it proves that it's being circulated. Because that air is popping from pipe to pipe to pipe as it heats up. You still have water in here. Yes. Was that a question? Well, it's, it's a comment. 
Yes, it could, it could create the situation. It could create it, and I'm going to, uh, I, if I have banging that's uh, uh, loud enough to be noticeable in a system, I'm going to recommend that it be serviced. Because in the end, isn't that just, isn't the banging and the, and the loud, loud banging uh, just a, a function of the air in the pipes? That's all I've ever understood it to be. No, because I had a house, and no matter what I did, I had the furnace guys out, I couldn't get rid of the banging. Well, that's because you didn't have the boiler guys out. You had the furnace oh. guys out. No, I had, in fact, I even replaced the boiler. And well, the we boiler wasn't it. the problem. The air in the pipes was, yeah. I'm being sarcastic Oh, here. yeah, it was. You had the technicians out. It and sounded didn't. like somebody hitting the, you know, the radiator with a hammer in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Pang, and. And they couldn't. The ghost. They <laughs> readjusted everything and drove me insane. So wow, I guess it would. I hated that. And, and at first you just say, oh, I'll have a technician come out and they'll bleed the system and it'll all be fine and you were comfortable then that yeah. it could be riveted. Then I, re I replaced it because it was a really old boiler. So you figured that would do the problem. And it didn't. And they adjusted the water levels and bled the radiator. So you had a heating company working with you to get rid of this and it still wouldn't go away. Yeah. They just said it was maybe defective when it was installed that way or something. I have one piece of advice for you. Sell the house in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then use the excuse when it bangs when they turn on the boiler in the summer. The excuse is, well, there's probably air in the pipes that I haven't had it on for five months now. So, you know, I'm sure a service call will take care of it. And, and everybody, including the realtor, go, yeah, that's, that's probably right. Force hot water. Different fuels, gas, oil, just like furnaces. Turn it on. It either operates emergency switch. Don't turn on the uh, don't turn on the breaker. There's nothing different. You're going to put your um, uh, carbon monoxide meter on top of the uh, on top of the uh, boiler and see if you get any generated uh, any carbon monoxide. And that's it. Those are the two main systems. 97, 97.3% of the houses you're going to inspect will have those two systems. Get comfortable with recognizing the difference between boilers and furnaces and don't walk into a house and call a furnace a boiler and don't walk into a house and call a boiler a furnace. Okay, it just shows you don't, you're, you're either ignorant or you're not thinking and neither one of them is good. Are you so involved and so nervous about this inspection that you don't know it's a furnace and a boiler? Words matter. And you're calling it the wrong system, and somebody being knowledgeable in the room is only going to throw doubt on the professionalism of your inspection. If you don't know how the system works, that's fine. But at least know what kind of system you're talking about and don't mistalk about it. Again, that image of professionals. Okay? I even got my wife uh, to quit calling my boiler a furnace. It only took 15 years. And then somebody else would come in the house and call my boiler a furnace, and guess who was the one correcting them? Steam systems. Steam systems, steam, steam systems. No, not really. Steam systems are exactly the same thing. You have radiators throughout the house. And you have steam going up to those radiators instead of water. So you create steam at the boiler. Steam rises through the pipes, goes up to the radiators, and... Uh, and um, and it will give off liquid as that water air, that uh, steam cools, and then that liquid comes down to be made back into steam. So they're taking the water, they're creating steam, the steam goes up. Once it cools down, it returns to its water state, it comes back down to the boiler, and it's made. So you're doing the same thing with steam as the way you're doing with the hot air and hot water. If the water cools, it comes back down and is reheated. If the steam cools, the water is, uh, will then return to its water, the steam will return to its water state and will come back down. 
Other than that, the boiler, it's still a boiler. So a steam boiler or a steam forced hot water, or a uh, forced hot water or a boiler uh, that generates steam. Those are the two systems. It's important that we learn how to identify the difference between a steam boiler and a forced hot water boiler. For anybody that hasn't read the book, any idea how you would do that? There are three indications. Three indications that, from my limited knowledge, I know what to do. I mean, I know what to look for. Site class on the steam? That's absolutely the most correct way of doing it. That's the most sure way of doing it. There's no way you have a sight glass on, uh, on a forced hot water. But the other two can be adapted. So the most sure way is a sight glass. And Joe's great book, because he did the picture, he found the pictures. And this is a shitty picture, but it's the only shitty one in the whole book. On the right, on page on 75. <laughs> you didn't hear that, did you, Joe? Nope. Okay. On the right hand, the 275, figure four, a sight glass. That, see that black column on the right hand side of that picture? That's water level that's in there. And it's going to be a sight glass that is a tube. And the water is going to be at a certain level in that sight glass. Now this is absolutely the sign of a steam system, and that's the first thing you're looking for. It's attached to the system like this. Now, in the manual systems, every day or so in the winter, you've got to go down and make sure the water level's up at that height. And there's a valve here that will allow you to turn it on and add water, and you just bring the water up to the, the site line. I don't know, I've never done it, but I, I'm assuming it's something like that. Okay? On the, and I had a, a, a friend of mine who had a steam system. Uh, she lived alone. Um, she was a friend of Patty's. And um, she had an old steam system, and she was going out of town. And they brought in, and so she had it replaced prior to her leaving. And she left in January for Aruba. And she had a brand new boiler system put in, steam system put in. And why would you do in the age this day when there's only 1% of the 1% of the houses maybe have steam, maybe 1%? Why would you do a steam system? Why not just get a forced hot water or a furnace? Sometimes you can't, you can't change all the uh, radiators. Right. Nobody's going to go through the expense of changing it all. I, I was surprised, with, and this was several years ago when I was a rookie, uh, and she got another steam system, and I, I was thinking about why in the world, but then it occurred to me, right, we have different types of radiators, different types of pipes, different type of system entirely. So you either get the same brand new steam boiler, or you change your whole system out, which has got to be ten times the amount of money. So that's exactly right. So you will find steam systems, because that house may have stayed under an ownership for well, whatever. It's a house that people are buying and selling, and it had it installed in it a steam system, and they're going to keep steam systems in there. So they're still making and installing steam systems. You just don't, they're not doing that on new homes. And eventually, you won't see steam systems anymore. But as an aside, where is steam actively used? Apartment buildings. Apartment buildings. And why is that? The pressure. Get up to the higher floors. You can't get the hot water up to those higher floors. Steam rises, so the only efficient way is in large systems like schools still have boilers, and, or still have steam, and large manufacturing units still have steam because they have a central area that they got to get the steam, the, the heat out to. Uh, either that or they have a bunch of smaller systems. But typically what you'll find, certainly in New York City, there's not a high-rise building there that's not using steam. Okay, so there is a, a commercial use for steam, just not much of a residential. And the only residential use for steam is uh, uh, where there was an existing system. New construction, nobody's putting in steam. But I guarantee you, if they're building uh, a new high-rise, they're going to be putting in a steam system. 
new schools are going to be put in and steam systems. What was I saying? What other things you can to tell? Sight glass. So the sight glass is for, uh, oh, oh, the story about our friend that she went away to Aruba and uh, she bought a brand new uh, steam system and she called around to three or four installers and one of them gave a significantly lower price of a couple thousand dollars and her being a smart shopper she went with the, 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 the less expensive price installed the steam system in it, they came in, they installed it in a day or two and it was in and running and she went away to Aruba came back and her whole house had frozen over you know why? No, manual system. Well, it, they sell these days for more money. Self-regulator. Self-regulator, thank you. I was searching for the word. And I, I think that that's that black box in the middle of that picture. That self-regulator watches the, the sight glass for you. She didn't get a self-regulator. The reason it cost less was that it was <coughs> a manual, and they didn't then instruct her on it. So they got the deal because they were cheaper, and then they didn't tell her why it was cheaper. It was, so she had compared self-regulating steam systems to a, a manual regulated steam system. So compare apples to apples. And even then, you got to be a friend of mine in <coughs> Scotia had a brand new steam system with a self-regulator. It was overfilling. So you still got to keep an eye. Everything. Yeah. Was, was the, because the regulator wasn't working right? It wasn't, I did, for some reason it wasn't functioning properly. It kept overfilling the system. Right. So, I, Maybe that's just an adjustment in terms of usage and that you have to kind of fine tune it as it was. Yeah, they don't know for sure. Yeah, the guy's coming back this week, but he shut off. You can disable the self regulator and, and, and then adjust you can it. Yourself. Do it. Thanks. Now, how did your friend's lawsuit go? <laughs> I don't think she bothered. I don't think yeah. she bothered to sue. But I think the, the mechanism itself is bad. Yep. A brand new boiler and the mechanism was bad. <laughs> now I don't know if she bothered to sue or not, but I know that uh, she didn't understand it, and then it had to be explained to her. Probably, hopefully, by an attorney, she should sue them. But what did they do wrong? They didn't instruct her. In and I'll bet you they could come up with five reasons why she wasn't paying attention or didn't bother and they left an instruction booklet on the table and she didn't read it. For some reason, they're still prevalent in Schenectady, Scotia area. The steam. My brother has them. Joe's, Joe's dad has it. My father just, just got a new one about only 15 yeah, years ago. Yeah, but isn't that because it's already been piped and everything oh, yeah. before steam? Yeah, but I just yeah. I just happen to see more in the Schenectady in the, County area right. for some odd reason. I don't know. Well, we don't. Run, I don't run into many of them. Uh, certainly not not up in the suburbs, no. Clifton Park. You're not going to no. find any of them. Only in the older areas, or, or older city areas, city areas city are city. you going to see steam. Well, here, I mean, a friend, uh, boiler guy told me once that they were upgrades. They're more expensive systems to have installed. So when these houses were built, they were actually upgrade systems. So they weren't cheap when they put them in. It was considered a superior yeah. Uh, yeah. system, yeah. steam. Yeah, hotter. People in Schenectady From yeah. what I've heard, I've never sure. lived in one. From what I heard, it takes a long time for that steam engine, uh, steam system, to heat the building or the house. But once it heats it, it's good. You know, it takes a long time for it then to cool back down. Right. But if you walk into a cold house and you fire it up, it's going to take a while to get to temperature. That's one of the great things about forced hot air. Turn on that forced hot air system, and uh, you're good to go in 15 minutes. If those steam lines aren't covered with asbestos, they'll heat the basement too. Oh, it heats the basement. It's like radiate heat right up to the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you get less of it upstairs because you're losing all that heat energy on the first, uh, in the basement area. That's why they inspect. Uh, that's who, back in those days, nobody lived in their basements. I think of the reason a lot of New York City uses it so much as New York City supplies it. New York City has steam lines underneath the, right. the entire city, which oh. feeds everybody. Huh. Didn't know that. The problem with that is you have to put wet, wet steam in 
then your pipes don't last for dealing. Radiators. Anybody want to contribute as to the difference between a rate? <laughs> Yo, thank you. <laughs> Contribute to the difference between telling between a forced hot water and, <laughs> and an electric there's a heater valve at the top of the radiator for forced water, and there's there's a, a little control controller at, at the mid level of the radiator for steam. Is that because you read the book, or is that because that's of personal because experience? I, that's because I show off. You're taking this course seriously? <laughs> seriously? <laughs> seriously? <laughs> That's either a yes or a no. Sure. Okay. Water will not blow this up until it fills the whole radiator. So let's say that a plug happens on the line that returns back down. Now the water is not escaping. The, the, the house isn't cold, warm. So hot water is being forced into the radiator, and it's not escaping, so what happens? Eventually it's going to blow up. They have a bleeder valve up here at the top of the radiator. I'm sure you've all seen them. And uh, that will let the water out because it needs to get up to this level to fill this up and to pop this, and then the water can pour out and destroy your floors instead of blowing up and destroying your walls. Steam fills from the top down. So the steam fills up the top part, and for the same reason the water builds up, less room for the steam, the steam is forced up into it, and eventually it becomes a bomb again. And so the leader valve, or release valve, you may call it, since it's, you're releasing steam. The release valve is down here where it becomes a danger. So you can tell by looking at the radiator, whether it's a steam ra radiator or a uh, forced hot water radiator, by where the location of the release valve. Is that 100% accurate? No. Is that 100% accurate? Oh, that's not I, the book, I, I, is I, I, That's I, not I, I can tell from experience that, that, that the valve, the leader valves on the top of the radiators, I have to let you. Okay, no, but is the location of the radiator relief valve, is that 100% indicative of which type of system it is? Probably not, because you have uh, baseboard. Can they be retrofit? Yes. One to I've seen forced hot water that they put in a forced hot water system. They didn't change out the radiators. And I was sitting there with a house that had the relief valve. Huh, you didn't know this, did you? <laughs> the relief valve was down here, and I'm downstairs, and it's forced hot water. Huh? They probably deactivated this, and they just hoped it wouldn't blow up. I don't know. I've never actually talked with a heating and cooling guy and said, are they bypassing all safety measures at all, or is there another way to take care of that? I don't know. But let's put it this way. I had seen forced hot water going into radiators like this, and I reported that out into my system. I mean, in the, to my client on a report, I reported that steam radiators were being used on a hot forced hot water system. Now, do I know that that isn't accurate? Do I, am I 100% certain that my client needs a warning about the wrong radiators on a forced hot water? No. Yeah. No. Am I 100% certain? I would say I would call it out. Yes, you would call it out, but are you 100% certain? No. 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 Be, but does it hurt to call out something you're not certain to be safe? Right. I do not mind saying that's a danger. And having the heating and cooling guy coming out and say, no, it's not, because it has this safeguard. And it's, and it's okay that this is a steam system. Contractors are going to call us idiots no matter what we do. Okay? So get used to it. You're a stupid, 
home inspector. You don't know anything. And the first guy that's going to say, tell the client that you're a stupid home inspector is the contractor. So never expect the contractor to go out there and say, wow, he's a smart guy. It's just not going to happen. Okay? It's just not going to happen, right? Realtors never, no, it's, realtors are okay. They, they don't, you know, they don't smirch us or not. It's the contractors that follow us in. We made a call. We made a call to bring a contractor in, and then the contractor called, walks in, and says he's an idiot. I, I don't quite understand that, but that does is what happens more times than not. But I don't mind erroring on the side of protecting my client in case it may be wrong. What I do know is the wrong radiator is a safety hazard, and I'm going to call it out without the knowledge, and I certainly don't want to tell my client, oh, it's probably okay. Because now you're telling them I'm going to, what the subtext there is, I'm going to call this out, but don't you worry about it, you're probably going to be safe. Because the client is already, remember the state of the mind of your client. He's already stressed out about the closing, about the school system, about moving, about the new job he's got, about whether his wife's going to like the long drive now that he's forcing her to do. There's a thousand things making the move to that house more of a stress. And you bringing up it may possibly be the wrong radiator and could be a safety hazard to your family doesn't need modifying by saying you'll probably be okay. Because what's he going to take that as? Don't worry. Do you want to put the in your client's mind, don't worry about the safety hazard? No. So you're going to call it out. You may not want to make it a major because you don't know that it's going to cost anything more than a, a relief valve. And I'm not going to make it a major. But to what you were talking about earlier, <clears throat> you don't know if it's broken. So you would say to evaluate it in your report. I don't want to lessen the effect I have on my client on something that's a, a if I believe that there's a good chance, but I'm not 100% certain, there's a good chance this could be a big issue. I'm going to call it out and I'm, I'm going to be, I don't mind people saying I'm just an idiot. That's fine. I got used to that a long time ago. I'm not sensitive anymore. <coughs> Because to learn all the stuff, you got to make mistakes. So I made every mistake. So I got a thousand stories out there about how Dan Osborne misreported something or misdid something. So that's okay. We can live with that. So I'm. It's a judgment call. I, I'm sure you guys have heard my speech that once you get, uh, we have to teach you this this class as black and white. But when you get out in the field, everything's gray. And this is one of those gray areas. When do you make the maybe? into something to help protect your client that you know is not going to listen to anything less. When do you get so excited about it that you're willing to call it possibly wrong just to make sure he pays attention? That's a gray area. We all have our toleration for that gray area, that line moving in the grays. And that's the, it's, you're going to have to decide that for yourself. I get those calls all the time. I get students from the last 15 years, 10 years. I get students from the last 10 years, guys that I taught nine years ago, still call me up and say, what would you do in this situation? Because they're in the gray area. They haven't been in that gray area before. They just want to hear me say, it's OK to do it the way. They're just looking for reaffirmation for what they did. And I don't mind doing that. I like being in contact with them. But it's always going to be a gray area that you're going to have to define for yourself. Every house is different, every situation is different, every client's different, everything's different, each time. And that line you're going to find as you go out there changes by inspection by inspection. Correct, Joe? Yep. Well, you had certain ideas about this job when you walked out there five years ago. It's completely different. Your mental model of how you start and where you end up you're continually learning every single time when you inspect. And that gray area gets wider and, and wider, wider and, and wider. wider. And honestly, I do err on the side of being safe. I know what we're going to be called idiots. But guess what? I'd rather be safe and have a contractor, as Dan said, go out there and say, did your home inspector know anything? Well, guess what? If I didn't do that and if something happened, right. 
You don't want to get a phone call. I, I was talking, or I was texting a, a friend of ours. He, uh, he went outside the realm and he operated the washer and dryer in an unoccupied house. Walked away, 10 gallons of water on brand new hardwood floors. And he did his best to clean it up and he's kind of trying to figure out if he is um, gonna get sued if, the, if they buckle. Well, he tests them because six inspections you were saying before, realtors are like, what do you mean you don't test the washer and dryer? What do you mean you don't test the washer and dryer? He's like, well, I know we're not supposed to test it because no, that's no, the no, end. no, we're not required. We're not required. Yes, we're not required. He goes, so I don't want to test it. But now I got realtors asking me why not, and I wanted. So he changed this process. Right. So here he changed it, and now he's like, wait a minute, it's not my fault. I just turned on the washer. He tested it. He tested it. It's not my problem. It's not hooked the up. The only time he could be sued if it was said in the standards of practice that he was prohibited from doing. It. Yeah. Because he was following his SOPs, he does it. He tested them before. So you're going to start how you inspect, then change your inspect. And I can guarantee you, after this, he's not going to be turned on the, the, the <laughs> wash machine for a little while now. So you end up do changing, and it, you just and the you know the biggest one is you know GFIs for sump pumps. You flip back and forth. Oh, you know what I mean? Because there's there is no right answer. But whatever you choose, you stick with it. And when it comes to safety. Don't make it a big deal where people are freaking out, but it's a little bit of CYA on your part, but also on your client's part. No, you're going to put it in the report so you can say it's there when they get ready to see it. Yeah. But there's more to it than that, and I know you know what I'm talking about. If, if you make an issue of it to them, repeat it a couple times, use it in your wrap up, mm -hmm. or just leave it in the report and don't talk about it. That's the difference. That's it's the whole difference in the world. Because yeah. I assure you, 92% of the people aren't going to take that long list of defects and read and follow every one of them. You know who they are. It's the detail people. And they're like, oh boy, they're <laughs> going to read everything. Otherwise, you know what? The, the, the guy looks at the summary, and then they'll find something interesting, and they'll, they're just like everyone else. They'll go look at a few pictures. You'll, you'll find out the reports weren't even open. You send it. And then you got to call the realtor and the agents or the people like, hey, you haven't opened up the report yet. It's been like three or four days. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> They're good because okay. you did such. No, and I always looked at that as a compliment because they looked at, they were with me during the inspection. Yeah. I communicated so clearly and well to my client that they didn't have any questions when we walked out of the house. They felt. And I always tell every inspection, I tell them, you're going to know what I know about this house when we leave here. And then tomorrow I send a report. So I make them feel comfortable that I'm not keeping stuff back that's going to show up in the report. So when we're done wrapping up and everybody's happy and they love the inspection and everybody's good and they give me the check and I walk out to my car and they're all standing out there on the side of the porch applauding my exit, you know they're happy. And they're not going to read the complete report because you told them what they wanted to do. And they're not going to investigate all the little language. And then you have the engineers in the group and the accountants in the group that are reading every freaking word. I freaked out one time early on. I did a condos up in uh, Lake George, uh, top of the world, condos up there. And I, I reported the uh, master bathroom in a condo as the surround being ceramic tile, and it was really, no, it was plastic, it was ceramic tile, and I reported it as plastic. And the woman called me up yelling at me. It wasn't even a defect. She read every one of my check boxes and compared it to what she thought the house and had a list of differences between what she saw and what she thought I was reporting. And so you have the other guys that don't read the report. So you have to be accurate. I told the woman, whoops, I did make a mistake. And my picture clearly shows what she said. I, I checked the wrong box. But some people are going to read every word and see everything, and other people are going to ignore it all and just go with your verbal, verbal report that you told them at the time of the inspection. Okay? <clears throat> Third thing. Any questions on radiators? I kind of got sided into report language. 
Any other questions about this uh, radiators? And, okay. Third thing is, anybody else want to tell me what the third thing is? Pipes. Steam requires bigger pipes. I don't know what four inch pipes. Anybody know what the size of the pipe is? Compared to the force hot water one inch pipes? I don't know. But, this, but the steam Caps. pipes are larger. And again, it's exactly the same situation. I have seen force hot water hmm. in old steam pipes. So they they're still using the same pipes. They didn't rip them out. And they have so the bigger uh, steam pipes are running the water to the radiators and then they just uh, change the end of the pipe into the smaller pipe to put it in the bet into the uh, uh, smaller holes on the forced hot water radiator. Is that a defect? No. If the, radiator, if the radiator's hot and it's working. I think we saw that in Troy a couple months ago. Um, and Chris was a plumber and just said that that was just going to overwork the system, but if it's generating heat, then that's all you can really do. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. I might make a verbal comment that, that pipe, those pipes aren't designed for this kind of system, but uh, it's a, I've seen it enough that I would call it a standard demodification. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, I, it's not like it's unusual. Well, it is unusual, but it's not rare. Okay. Out of out of. Uh, oh, actually, if you look at the number, well, I don't know. I don't know how to look at it. But what I'm saying is, it. I have seen it more than once where I've had radiator steam pipe or steam pipes used with forced hot water radiators. As long as that radiator gets hot and the system is working and it sounds fine, I'm going to let that go. I might verbally tell him. Oh look, they use the old steam pipes, and I'll explain that to them, to the <coughs> radiators. It appears to be working now. You, when, next time you have the heating and cooling guy in, you might want to talk with him about how it's going to affect the unit, but it's working now. And again, it's the fact that they got a thousand things on their plate. You're going to tell them you're going to do it in such a manner that you're not excited and you're not worried about it, and he's going to say, okay, that's okay, and he's never going to make that phone call. He probably will never even remember remember to talk to the heating and cooling guy about it. But it, you at least want to tell him about it, and I'm not even going to bother to write it up. <coughs> Area space heaters. Fireplaces. Gas space heaters. Electric baseboards. You're going to go to all those gas space heaters, and you're going to turn it on, see if it operates. You're going to look in the fireplace as we do with our fireplace inspection, okay, which we've covered in another lesson. And your, in your gas space heaters, you're going to identify the fuel, you're going to take a picture of it, you're going to turn it on and get it to operate, and include it in your report as a picture operator is designed. I'll take my heating system, if I have a house full of gas space heaters, I'm going to take them. Uh, so gas space heaters in the checklist, uh, let's just say gas space heaters. I'm going to show the two of them that are in the house, and I'm going to, under one banner, I'm going to, uh, in one concern box, have the two pictures of the two different gas space heaters, and say operators on designed on the day of this, uh, on the day of the inspection, and it was um, good condition, gas was the uh, supply, etc. On electric baseboards, it's a little bit more complicated in doing the inspection. And, um, and I think you have to, I think you have to do more than just report them out. I think you have to test every one of them. Uh, and then testing every one of them in a strange house can get a little confusing. So I devised a system. I will tell you how I do it. Um, so at least you'll know about how you do need to make sure you check everything. I go up to the top floor, and I start at the stairway, and I circle the house, and I count on the top floor how many thermostats I turn on. Okay, so I have a four-bedroom house. The base, the bathroom has one. 
and the master bathroom has one. So let's say I have four bedrooms upstairs, a master, and a, a hallway bathroom. So that's probably six baseboards, maybe one in the hall, but probably not. I have six baseboards. I walk around the ha that top floor, counterclockwise or clockwise, it doesn't matter, whatever you feel comfortable with, and turn on counting the whole time. Turn them up to maximum. And then by the time I get back to the stairway, I then take my uh, heat, heat gun sensor, and I walk around, and I shoot shoot the baseboard radiator, uh, uh, the conductor, the baseboard heating unit, and I turn it off. And it's either hotter or not. So I keep count. I have six units. I shoot the first one, it's warm, I turn it off. I shoot the second one, it's warm, I turn it off. I do the third one, it's warm, I turn it off. I do the fourth one, it's cold, I turn it down anyway. I go to the fifth one, it's warm, I go to the sixth one, it's off. I go back to it, and I'll put, in my note side, I put upper level 5-1. Five operating, one defective. I walk back into the room, I take a picture of the, of, of the defective one, and I note which bedroom it is. I go down to the first floor, redo the process. So now I have six working, six radiators upstairs, and uh, six electric baseboards upstairs, I have five downstairs, one downstairs didn't work, and one upstairs didn't work. Now I take my two pictures, the two, I identify what room in my concern box, etc. This house has 12 or 11 electric baseboard units, two of which were not working. One was in the bed, uh, is in the, uh, the dining room on the first floor, and one was in the third bedroom on the top floor. Do I care which one is the third? No, I just call it a name. They'll know when they go in and test it. They'll find it. I don't spend time. How do I identify that empty room to them? Or if I can't identify it, the one with the fireplace, whatever. The location's not important because what they now see is you did a thorough inspection of every unit. You turned them all on and you identified the two that weren't working. I think that's a thorough inspection of an electric baseboard house. Tell them how many units they have in the house and test every one of them. Why do I want to make sure I turn them all off? So you're not going to run up to the electric if, if I don't do it in a systematic way, walking around, shooting, and turning off, and counting, and identifying, I'm going, and then marking down on my checklist, if I don't identify it, what's going to happen? I'm going to miss one. Mm -hmm. And if you miss one, now, I didn't, it didn't get turned off. If you just randomly walk around the house, turning on electric baseboards, and randomly walk around the house hoping to turn them all off, what happens? You miss one. And you either start a fire or get a large electric bill. And if that's an empty Or you leave the house, and it's really hot, and then the client comes back home, yep. and you realize, like, oh, I left the heating system on, and then the listing agent calls the <laughs> buying agent, and the buying agent calls you, and you're getting your ear chewed off. And don't think they talk about nice things at the water cooler at the uh, at the. At Jeez, the Joe, has that ever happened to you? I did that with a with a big agent in my second year. And you can you can apologize so much, you can write a letter so much, and it's not going to change their mind. So the minute you make a mistake, chalk it up, saying I'm sorry. Maybe you can write a letter, maybe they'll change their mind, but honestly, once a realtor has a bad taste about you, spend your energy working on the ones that like you and, and finding new ones. Don't spend a lot of energy trying to convert the old ones that don't like you. And just hope that that realtor does have a lot of clout with the other realtors in the office. Mm -hmm. Types of fuel. There are oil tanks, are oil supply systems, there are gas systems, um, and then you have uh, electricity for your electrical system, and then, um, and then you're going to have propane. When you find a system that's being run by some of the non-standard, like solar, etc., uh, the fortunate thing about it, if you make a practice of looking up every house you're getting ready to inspect, 
if you make a practice of Googling it to find out the address, to find out if it's an attached garage or a detached, to find out if there's any outbuildings. One of the nice things about all the alternative heating systems is the, the realtors love to put the what they call essentials in the MLS. And they actually must put it, and it must be accurate. There's rules, aren't, isn't there? Yes. They have to make, if there's a solar system there, or a solar heating system in there, they got to put that in. They can't just leave it out. It's disclosure. So, you can look at the MLS, and when you Google it, there it is. You're going to see some of the Google, it's going to be just the general uh, uh, listings on the house. But one of them, or two of them, are going to say MLS. That means that ad got its data off of the MLS. That you can go by as 95% accurate. And it's going to have a solar system there, or it's going to th have a thermal system there where it was being heated by, what's it called? Uh, geothermal. Geothermal system. And that's going to be there. Look before you leave. Don't walk out to the house and get surprised by this. I walked out to the house uh, in my first year, and, uh, and my client met me at the driveway all excited about this geothermal system. Oh my God, what do I do with a geothermal system? I don't know anything about how it works. I don't know if geothermal uses warm water from the ground or the heat from the core of the earth. I have no idea how geothermal systems work. So what you guys exactly, I bet you every one of you have at least the same amount of knowledge right now about geothermal systems that I do, and some of you may have more. How would you respond in that situation about your heating system? I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a no. Buzz. What would you say to your client? Just be honest. Like, listen, I don't, you can have another guy come out who's experiencing to this or a qualified contractor, but simple as that. It is as simple as that. The first thing I said, oh, great. You know, I haven't seen it geothermal system before. We, it's not a non-standard system. Now, I've done five houses. I can, I can tell you this is the first year. I, didn't, I don't have to say this is my sixth inspection. I just have to say all the other systems I see are furnaces or boilers. I can't wait to see this system. And for the record, it was installed by a qualified contractor in the area because they are non-standard. And what I would do is I'm going to go down and test to make sure it comes on. I'm going to turn it, turn it on at the thermostat. I'm going to operate the system. It's either going to work or it's not going to work. And then from that point on, the best thing I would advise you to do is get the information about the installer and let's call and call him and have him tell you about the system because I can't. So you're right. Be honest. Just do it in a manner that it doesn't show that it's your fifth inspection. And this guy told me, yeah, there's a lot of them up here in Saratoga. Well, 3,000 inspections later, I still haven't seen another one. So now I can say before it was the first one out of five. Now that, that first one out of five is now the first one out of 3,100. Okay? So there's not a lot of them around, no matter what that client said. Do you run into many of them? I haven't seen one personally. Well, my my buyer thought every house on the block was done with thermal to listen to him talk. So, you, and you're exactly right. Do not, you know, don't, don't pretend to know anything about it. If it's not a furnace, a boiler, or a steam system, say it's a non-standard system. We don't see these very often. My knowledge is limited. Let's go in and turn it on. Because what we do know is turning it on is turning on the thermostat. You don't have to be a brain surgeon and don't walk downstairs and look at the systems and go, oh my God, look at that. I wonder what that is. Kind of stand back and keep your mouth shut. Take your pictures. Don't advertise that you're an idiot. It's always good not to advertise that you're an idiot. Okay? So you're going to see the non-standard systems. But you're, the advantage to the non-standard systems, and the point I'm trying to make is it shows up in the LMLS. Now you know you're going to be walking into a geothermal situation. And as Joe keeps saying, Google it. There is all that information. If you have an hour before the inspection, it will only take you 10 minutes to read. I'm sure you can find an article about geothermal.
thermal heating system, at least to get some of the buzzwords. Your story will never change. You're going to say the same thing. But at least if you have some of the terminology when you walk out there, you at least sound, sound like you're old, slightly knowledgeable. And 15 minutes on the internet these days, you can, you can become pretty knowledgeable pretty damn quick. You could ask Siri in the car on the way there. Siri, tell me about geothermal. And you'll probably get that answer. I'm sure that geothermal comes in different varieties, the different way it heats the house, the same way solar does. I don't know that, but at least by Googling it, it's going to shoot to start at the big picture and say, yeah, geothermal systems are multivaried and they work with either hot water or not. I don't know. But you're going to find out more than you know if you don't Google it up. Okay? Let, as, as, uh, as Joe continually says, and I continually agree with him, uh, you, the internet is your friend. Okay? I, I guess the only thing you really have to be careful of, and it could be anything for the internet, is the data that you're reviewing, understand the source. Don't read the first thing. Yeah. There's some really like uh, it could be a manufacturer yeah. that's trying to put. There's a some spin good on. websites like it's called in Inspectopedia. Yes. Inspectopedia is really knowledgeable. It's they have more information you can ever think of. So once you find a good source, you talk to other people, other home inspectors. I like I always say, exchange each other's numbers because you guys are going to use each other, help each other out when you get multi-families. <coughs> find a source and understand that 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 data. God forbid you get data off the internet that's not true. Um, types of fuels, let's talk about natural gas. Natural gas comes in at a meter at the house. Uh, that I still, it's still my belief, and nobody's convinced me otherwise, that it does not matter the kind of pipe it is. It doesn't have to be the black pipe. It can be galvanized. There's all. There is an argument to be said that when you're having intermixing changes of natural, uh, of natural gas, uh, the, uh, the taking a, a galvanized pipe and that black pipe, which I've been told is just colored galvanized pipe, but I'm not 100% certain of that because of different sources. But the, the thing that does make sense is if you have a natural gas meter, when you're checking the pipe, go to just the bonds. Go to you don't don't worry about the pipe leaking, because you'll know if a pipe's leaking just by walking down in the basement. Your head, head, face will be hit with natural gas, and you'll smell it immediately. And then your nose becomes accustomed to it. The opening of the door pushed some of the air out because it was being released, so you get a wave at that, and then you won't smell it anymore. Go with that first smell. Don't think you're going to go down there and smell it a second time. Nine times out of ten, you won't. Make your call immediately. When you open that door and you walk into the basement and it smells natural gas, it's going to go away. It won't stay with you. Two things happen. The concentration of it has now been uh, uh, diffused, and your nose has become used to it. So go with your gut, because I've been in a lot of houses that had gas that I smelled the first time, and then we found the leak with the little uh, carbon mono uh, gas uh, meter, and we found a leak at the, uh, most of it is always at the junction between the pipe coming in and your unit. If it's a gas space heater or if it's a gas, you're going to go to the connection between the two, the pipe and the unit, and it's nine times out of ten. That's where the guy, the technicians start doing their bubble test. They'll take soapy water and just put soapy water on it and it'll start bubbling up at the loose. I'm not sure why they don't all use meters. I didn't need meters. Jamie was my meter. Jamie is very sensitive to mold and he's got asthma and I could put him in a house and he can find the leak in a heartbeat. He can find gas leaks in where I don't smell it. He found a gas leak out on the, uh, on the outside front porch and it was underneath the, uh, it, a pipe underneath the sidewalk, right at the, where it joined, was underground outside. And he literally took it, this we were in Troy, and he took a first step up on that pipe and he says, I smell gas. And we called it in, and I'd learned to trust his nose. The city had a guys out there before we were, we were still outside doing the, doing the roof inspection, 
back then we used a ladder and we got out there. Before we were done with the roof inspection, the guys walked up. They were used to us because we were the only guys using, uh, 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 that were, we were doing a lot of inspections on multifamily homes and they always had gas leaks. So they walked up and says, you guys again? We go, yeah, where's the leak? Here on the front porch. No. And they started arguing with it. Well, not arguing, but they, they couldn't believe it. They literally took out a, a testing piece of equipment that was about this wide. It looked like a jackhammer. And they inserted the tip into the ground where Jamie pointed. And they did something, I don't know, because we're just sitting there. We're finishing up the outside of the house while they were out there testing. We walked around. They said, you son of a bitch. How do you see find that? It took their piece of equipment to tell, and Jamie did it by walking up. So trust your nose. Um, when you see, so when you use one of your meters, use it on the joints, uh, test the pipes uh, if you smell something. I don't standardly go into a gas house and test pipes. I did when I first started in the business because, you know, when you're a rookie, you're trying to be as absolutely thorough as possible. We all do that. And now, after about 100 inspections and never a gas leak, I quit doing it standard. I needed to smell gas before I started testing for gas, if that makes sense. If I don't smell gas and everything's operating fine, I'm not going to go around and check every pipe. Okay, I have no reason to believe there's a leak. If I smell something, then I, then, then I have a reason to believe there's a leak. Same can be said for propane, except <clears throat> propane doesn't have the odor that they add to the, do, correct Joe? No, 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 no propane they add. Do they add? It smells like, oh, like a garlic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I just haven't done a propane system in so yeah, long. That's oh, no, I haven't smelled it. I've never smelled a system that had, I've never had a, that's what this. I didn't think they had odor. Propane doesn't have its own natural. They actually Well, no, they it. added to natural gas, too. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like it's a sulfur. It, it is. It's added to both gas. That's, yeah, it's, it's, that's the odorant you're smelling right. in a natural gas situation. There's one caveat to that, too. And that's if your tank is getting really low, you may smell that uh, even though it's the, the same as burning. Oh, the propane? Yeah, you may smell that. Because it's a heavier concentration that's in yeah, the bottom of the tank. Apparently so. And when it's burning, it's still leaving its odor around? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, it's not heavy, but right. you, you know, you can tell when your tank's getting low. And nine times out of the time, when it comes to propane, the regulator is right off the top of the, you know, the tank. That's They fail. You know what I mean? If yeah. you get a smell, usually that's where it's coming from. The regulator? From. The regulator usually is gone bad. Um, I'm going to quickly go over the gas lines again since we're back on the gas topic. I know we've covered it in the past. I believe we've covered it so far in, uh, in the last three months. Here's your burner. Here's your unit. Here's the burner for the, let's just call it a, a furnace. So I have the, the hot air going out, here's my flue pipe, here's my gas line, this is called the drip leg, uh, and the drip leg being in the correct location is your gas line comes down, and at some point when it makes a turn, you have an additional uh, extension of pipe, and that pipe collects the impurities in the gas. Okay. These impurities, when they get to the burner, will clog up the jet on the burner and have been known to shut the burner, uh, the uh, boiler down. And the impurities in this have been known to fill up to such a degree that the gas doesn't even make it there and it does shut down. When you say, see this situation, same situation, and the drip leg's there, that's ineffective. Okay? You need your drip leg to be at the bottom run of a vertical drop. 
because gravity is taking the impurities down into the drip lake, where here the gas speed going through is not going to collect the impurities in the pipe. Okay? Which can cause the shutdown of the system. So is that just in the vertical wave? What would it have horizontal waves going down? What? You're showing the gas line come down. Suppose you're coming up from the bottom, going into a, a unit. You mean if I had a gas line going here? Up like that. Somewhere in the system there has to be a vertical drop. And, and I'm not changing the subject, I'm just showing you what I mean. Sometimes you will see a feed coming over from another appliance. And it's up in the joist. And the drop is here. And then this line goes down and goes into the boiler here. Okay? It's at this drop. It, as long as it's at, now here's a single line. It doesn't matter whether this drip leg is there or down here. Sometimes you'll see it up here. Just make sure your drip leg is at the bottom of a vertical drop. Now, to your question, with that said, along that line somewhere from the meter had better be a vertical drop or it's not going to have the drip leg and then the impurities are going to make it to the burns. So if it's a system that's only going up, the impurities are still there. I'd write that up. No drip leg noted on the system. This may cause uh, 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 um, impurities to plug the gas line at the burner, which could cause the system to fail. Recommend to qualify contractor repair as necessary. And is there a cap on the time of that? Yes, and they are cleaned out periodically. They should be cleaned out when you have the furnace cleaned or the boiler cleaned. Seldom is that ever done. Furnace? <laughs> the gas line. No, the gas line cleaned when the technician shows up to do that. What, did I say something wrong? I'm good? Yeah. Any questions about natural gas? And uh, sometimes you'll see no drip leg at all. That's also the these impurities. That would be what I call no drip leg at all if I don't see a drip leg in the pipes when they when they come up in your vertical example or uh, going up example. No drip leg in that line. Now there may be one behind a wall someplace, but if I don't see a drip leg, I'm calling it out because you think about it. You know, drip leg doesn't seem like much, and it can cause a problem, but there's a reason why 100% of the systems all are designed with a drip leg on the gas line. Who are we to say, oh, that's inconsequential, that can't happen? The whole industry pipes their lines with drip legs. They're doing that for a reason. They're not doing it because they have nothing to do that day. Hey, let's make up a bunch of drip legs. Hey, let's put them on the bottom end of a vertical. If the industry's doing it, it's worthy of reporting by you. Okay? Now my favorite topic, oil tanks. tank in the basement. And no, for the record, art was not a part of my college education. I did not take any art classes. No, these don't really look like legs, do they? Okay, well, it's an oil tank, believe it or not. <laughs> TV of <laughs> Pardon? TV of Rogers. Yeah, TV. Okay, I can go. I'm good with that. Um, first of all, this is one of three classifications. They classify the oil tanks by where this tap comes out. 
there's either a top tap, there is an end tap, or there is a bottom tap. A top tap, this is the end tap. A bottom tap is a pipe coming down out of the bottom and then the filter and then the oil line running over to the heating system. Got that? This is the end tap which comes out on this end in the circle. It comes out right here. And then there's the top tap which is a two pipe system because there is a pump over here that pushes oil in that causes oil to be pushed back up. These two lines go down into the tank and by pushing oil in here it pushes it up and then pushes it up against gravity. These two are gravity systems. This is run by a pump at the heating unit. The top tap is used when the receiving unit, whether it's a hot water heater, a furnace, or a boiler, is upgrade, or these pipes. Let's say you're in a basement and you have a doorway, and your, your line would be coming over, and they'd go in front of the walkway area from where you come in the door, so they may want to run these pipes over the door so that nobody's tripping on the oil lines. Mm -hmm. And since they're doing that, they need the two pipe system because it's got to go uphill. Also, if this is a buried oil tank, it's going to be an uphill run to the heating unit. So it needs to be a um, top cap. In tap is where the oil comes out the end goes through the filter, and then a single line going over to the heating unit. And then the bottom tap goes into the filter, coming out of the bottom of the tank, goes in the filter, and then goes over to the heating unit. The end tap, as you all can imagine, is uh, not manufactured anymore. I think it quit being manufactured in the 60s. So what the book says? Any idea why? Leaks. Pardon? Leaks. Well, that's an excellent guess. Because oil wasn't being drained from the whole tank. There was this residual inch underneath this pipe. So the space between the bottom of the tank and the exit pipe was about an inch. And all the impurities in the water and, uh, for example, uh, the, the official term is gunk. All of the gunk that was in the oil then accumulates here. And it becomes very acidic and it works its way and causes a leak in the bottom of this tank. In the 60s, they quit producing in taps because of that very reason. So they started using bottom taps. <clears throat> Have you seen any in taps? Oh, yeah. Is uh, it a defect? Absolutely. Uh, actually, it's a terrible defect because I haven't seen, I've, out of 10, uh, I've probably seen in taps out of 3,100, probably. I've, seen in taps maybe 50 to 100 times. So a couple times a year, let's go with that, two or three times a year, in taps. Because they're older systems, so you're going to find them in the older houses. If you have an oil system in a 15-year-old house, I guarantee you it's going to be a bottom tap. Although I've been to newer houses that I don't know where they got the bottom tap, but the rule of thumb is it's going to be an older house. And there, so right now we know this unit is 50 or 60 years old and it's had all this gunk. And I've got a long story about uh, one of the one I found 
Uh, but let's put it this way. I'll, I'll keep the story short because this lesson's going on long. I put my hand under the bottom, which you never should do unless you're willing to take the risk. But I was willing to take the risk. I put my hand under the tank and I pressed the bottom and my hand came away black. Okay? So it was already seeping into the surface of it, and it was a matter of days or weeks or a month before it was just going to drop all its oil in the basement, and that's the issue. It's going to wear away that lower level. And I touched the bottom of that, um, and they've been perfectly clean and no problem. But, but I had my hand come way black, and that's enough to make sure that I'm calling it out, and it's a serious issue. The tank's over uh, 60 years old, almost 70 years old now. The last one they installed. What's the chances the one I'm looking at was the last one they installed? So it's going to be older than that. Um, and um, and it may cause a, a, a biohazard if there's a sump pump uh, uh, and that tank drops 200 gallons into the basement. It's going to get into the sump pump and it's going to go out in the yard, etc. And you may have the EPA involved. So it is a serious matter if it's the bottom tap. And it's also a great find with you because your client walked by it and doesn't know the difference. There's more often than not the client when he looks at something he knows it's bad and you're going to report on it. It's not very often we have information that he's not even, he's clueless about. There may be 20 items or 30 items in a whole house that I can look at that I know something that he doesn't because he looks at it and he doesn't know it's bad. This is one of them. Um, so you're going to write it up as 60 years old. I'm going to recommend its replacement and make it a major. Because this has to be removed. The oil has to be pumped out. A new tank brought in and, and put in its place and the oil will be filled. And I'm sure that that could be over $1,500. Anybody have any experience with removing an oil tank from a basement? How much, Grant? Uh, it would have been, but he used it, used the oil for a uh, shop. So he so he bought the oil from. He he took he just took it for nothing. Oh, uh, but but yes. he, it would have cost well over that. Okay, so if it was an empty tank, you would have wound up paying well over a grand. Yeah, because it was. Yeah. Did he replace it with another tank? No, I went to uh, gas. Gas. So, uh, Incon is working desperately to change legislation that makes it illegal to lose, leave abandoned oil tanks in a basement. Right now, you can leave an abandoned oil tank in the basement, switch over to your natural gas, disconnect that oil tank, and we're all good to go. And leave it there forever. Uh, I advise my clients, I know realtors hate hearing these words, I advise my clients to make it a part of the contract that when they say, what's the term for cleaning up everything, broom ready or? Yeah, broom sweat broom swept, that they include the oil tank with it, and that just sends the realtors over the freaking edge. And if I don't like the realtor, I say it as soon as I can when I'm in the room. <laughs> but it's, no disser it's a disservice to your client without mentioning the fact that try to use the, and this isn't inappropriate, I don't believe, you tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. It's no, it, I do not think it's inappropriate considering the cost and expense of removing one of these things that doesn't have any oil in it, to try and use the removal of the oil tank as leverage in a bartering tool in the, uh, in the real estate transaction. Sure. Would that be correct? Yeah. Because realtors do that all the time. They'll negotiate one thing or another. Mm -hmm. Well, getting rid of the abandoned tank, I think, is a useful item. I'm going to complain about it, I'm going to throw it on the table, and then when I take something back, I'll take that back, but I don't want to take back the Federal Pacific Panel because I really want that. It's all a negotiation thing. So you're advising your client, I don't think is irresponsible, uh, you're advising your client that that tank should be removed and try to get that tank removed by the, uh, uh, by the homeowner. And they'll fight you over that, but that's okay. It's all part of the negotiation process. Because at some stage, INCON will get their way and somebody's going to have to get rid of it at the time of the sale. Because they're not going, once you sell a house, you can't sell it without the, 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 that, with that tank still there. It's going to eventually be the homeowner's responsibility to get rid of it. 
So you might as well try and get this guy. He wants to sell to you or you wouldn't have got a signed contract. So let's help our client recognize that this could be a negotiating tool. And who knows, you may get it. And then you don't have to go through the $1,000 expense at a later date when the state mandates that you get rid of it. Okay? So, the end tap is a no-no. The bottom tap is good. The top tap is perfectly fine. Those go over to the supply or the, the furnace or the boiler and power that. Uh, I'm going to inspect the legs and the condition of the steel and um, the pipes. I need, Joe, do you remember? Is it the supply pipe or the vent pipe that has to be steel? I think it's the supply, the pipe, the, not the vent pipe. I have gone out to the what, house what? and both of them are... Uh, Usually they're the same material. I never really saw them two different materials. You know, it says in here that... The well, the, he, well, I wrote that and, and he read it, so... No, it, it, I've seen... Um, you probably have. What, uh, what's the classic? Poly PVC. PVC. PVC pipe used. Oh, yeah. As a vent line. Yes. Yeah. As long as the supply uh, yeah. line is steel, you're good to go. I've gone out and seen both PVC and was one PVC and the other uh, steel. What is up in the air that I've tried to research and I've never been quite clear is your vent line, it's okay if your supply line is parallel, but your vent line has to be a, 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 a slope. I've never really called that out at any inspection. There's something about, well, if the vent line is sloped, uh, uh, it stops something or other from happening. I think maybe it's so that X, or maybe it's the supply line that has to be sloped because they don't want the residue oil to stay in this line. They want it to be able to flow down into the tank. I don't know. So that's the third thing you may want to look up for a more definitive answer. I always see them, well, I don't always see them sloped. I, I've never seen both pipes level. I've either seen one level and one sloped or both sloped. See, in my house, I think they're both PVC. I never saw a supply line PVC. Never? Not a supply line. Yeah. That, that tank, tank that I just talked about, the one that I touched the bottom and it was oily, two PVC pipes coming in. So, so my my so here was and I know that the uh, there are a lot of ethical uh, heating and cooling uh, oil supply companies that will not fill up an in tap tank. Yeah, this was being filled up and had two PVC pipes and it was. I just want to collect the money. Yeah, exactly. So, it's they're not supposed to be being filled up, and if the technician notices that it's an that it's an in tap or notices that there's PVC. He shouldn't be filling it up. And the other thing about it, just as an aside, if they do bother to remove it, and you have your two outside the building, here's your supply, and here's your vent line. You know, your pipe's on the side of the house. Here's the side of the house. Here's the grade. There's your vent pipe. And this is the uh, oil tank in the basement. If, uh, in this you see, I have seen the pipes come in and be open, and the rest of and the cut, pipes cut off there, the tank's gone, and I have my vent and supply pipe outside and the open in on the inside of the house. And I've had many a story, and I've talked with the guy that was buying a house, and he was buying a house that had exactly this same situation. And I was telling him about the possibility of the driver supplying and after on a Saturday morning he's out making his runs and he was out late Friday night and he went to the wrong address and he found the supply pipe on a house that he thought was on their route and he wasn't at a house that was on the route. He got the number wrong because he had a late night 
and he went and he dumped his whole truck because he was on his cell phone and it was pumping and it never cut off, never filled up. He dumped his whole truck into their basement. I told that story to the guy. The guy looked at me and says, I did it. I used to work and I did that. I went to the wrong house. I didn't dump my whole truck in there, but I was pouring a pipe, uh, I was pouring oil into the house. So I thought it was odd that I had that story and here was a guy that actually had done it. So when you go down in the basement and you see pipes outside, if you do not see an oil tank and you see it's going over, look to see where those pipes are to make sure that they're at least capped here. They should be capped or removed on the outside. I always just suggest cut them off, remove them, get rid of them. But you do not want a house with those pipes on the side and it not being oil house. Even if you have a tank there, I would consider at least, even if you have a tank, that's at the end of it, at least get rid of those pipes if you're not using the oil. Because do you even want somebody to drop off oil into your tank, into your basement? And yeah, they drop it off and it's not destroying the environment, it's not destroying your basement, but now you have a tank full of oil in your basement. And what a hassle that is to get rid of. I mean, yeah, you get the guy you can sell it to, but best laid plans of mice and men don't always work out right. I've had my tank filled by accident by somebody that didn't know what they were doing. And how hard was it to get rid of that? Oh, I ended up buying it. I had, a, I had an empty tank anyways. I had ordered from somebody else and somebody else. <laughs> they, were, they were supposed to deliver it to three doors down. And they delivered, they delivered to, to my house. They saw two spigots. They saw the two pipes outside and they filled me up. And you had an order in for a while? From somebody from a different company. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Let's talk about buried oil tanks. My very favorite subject. Buried oil tank is in the yard. We see signs of it because I got two pipes in the middle of the yard coming out, uh, but not in the middle of the yard, three or four foot away from the house. And obviously oil tank size pipes, one with a vent cap on the top of it and one with a screw tap on the top of it. I go into the basement and I find a system that is gas. And I see in the side of the wall in the basement two filled holes about the size of a dime right next to each other. Right in the area what are the where are the furnaces? What are those signs of? Was oil 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 oil. What? They used to have an oil fire system. They used to have an oil fired system. And there may be a very tank. tank outside. That is not being used now. Okay, <coughs> it's not currently being used. What's my issue? <coughs> Why is that a defect? It's not being used. It's been it's abandoned. Buried. Abandoned basement oil tanks are fine. Contamination ground. Contamination of what? The ground if the oil leaks out. Okay. Well, you know, this tank has been filled. And I'll have every seller and every realtor tell me that it's been properly taken care of and filled with with sand. So are we good? No. no. Because why? Well, I don't know that, but I'm not liable if I've been informed by an agent of the seller that he's on record and he'll lose his license and I get a smile. Okay? So. I, I'm not liable for what an agent says because he's a legal representative of that seller and if he mis misrepresents the truth, he's in trouble, correct? So I don't have to worry about it. If he tells me that it's been filled with sand, oil, or sand, I'm all good, correct? We're all good? Everybody can go home now? No. Why? Because if it leaks into the ground, the client's responsible. But it was filled. You're not, nobody's sure of that, it's buried. But it's filled, and my realtor said it was. So it doesn't matter. The ground could be contaminated already. Thank you. I'm sorry, you were there. He just said it. I'm more succinct. <laughs> he did it much better than you did. That, That's why I hate you. No, you have an admirer. You, you have an admirer. Okay. 
So what did you say again? Yeah, you didn't say it well. The, the, the no. <laughs> it's like, kind of like ground, Chinese food. Ground, if you eat it, it's just gone. The ground could be contaminated already. <laughs> right. Guess who owns that spill that happened 30 years before? Current owner. Current owner. How do you make sure that that soil isn't contaminated? Test, have it tested. There's no other way out of this. If I found out that there used to be an oil tank here, I want to see the documentation, and I want my client to see the documentation that it wasn't contaminated. Now, that's a hard line. I will agree that's a hard line. Because if it's been, and it's been 20 years since it's been taken out, or 10 years since it's been taken out, if it hasn't contaminated local water supplies now, it's not going to. I think that's a fair argument, and I'd give in to that. But I'm telling you right now, if the EPA gets involved with any aspect of this, it can get really pricey, really quick, really fast. What you have to do is make sure that if you have knowledge that there is the possibility of a buried oil tank in the yard, that the soil is tested. Now, I have gone out to a house, and I had my pipes. Here was the ground. Here's the house. And about six foot away were my two pipes. I thought that was kind of a large stretch. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. In the bed, in the uh, mulch bed here, under a bush, were two pipes. I missed it the first time. And then the winter came and the pipes were exposed. My client noted it and gave me a call. He said, that's okay, Dan, I missed it also. Because I went out to his house, he saw two pipes, I looked at my report, there were no signs of it. He looked, we looked at the pictures on the report, found out that the whole bed had bushes in it and everything. Nobody would have found those pipes. There were no signs of those pipes being protruded in the house? No, there was no signs in the basement at all. Because you can cover it over. If they just patch those holes, you'll see two holes there. But if you cover over the whole wall, you won't see the patch. Okay, that had been done. The only signs we had were two pipes in the, only in the wintertime, or he was doing some landscaping and he cleared it away, that's what it was. And when he cleared it away, the two pipes were there. So he didn't blame me, it's just a part of it, he wanted my advice. So he had a contract, no he did, he, he dug. He dug it out, he dug a trench, followed it, and it led him to here. And guess what he found out when he got down here? So Nothing. Those, those pipes are going away from the house? Is that what you're Yes. Going? Okay. They were going away from the house and he dug his trough and it was about six or seven inches so he was digging, digging, digging a trench following those pipes out to what he and I both believed were going to be a buried oil tank out eight foot away from the house. We got out there and find the capped end of those two pipes and no tank. They had fucking took and taken the tank out of the ground and left the pipes in place. What are they assholes? Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to use that word, it's a pejorative. <laughs> yeah, you're on video. Yes, I'm on video. Fucking asshole. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you right now, I couldn't believe it. Pipes were there, pipes were here, tank was gone. Wouldn't that show up on the MLS? Because that full disclosure when you buy a piece of property. That could have been done any time before the current owner didn't know anything about an oil system being there. Everybody's going to say I didn't know anything about it, and that would be true. And plus, there's no problem because there was a tank there then that had to be more than eight years ago. The previous owner, he declared that he didn't know anything about it. The furnace uh, supports that because when he bought the house, it had a, a gas-fired furnace. So there was no evidence supporting the fact that the client may know, and it didn't matter because the current owner is the one. And the only damage here is the possibility of an oil Eat, uh, uh, oils uh, contaminating the soil, and what would happen is under it, this is what the buried oil tank would look like, filled with dirt all around it, and there's going to be two pipes coming out. The two pipes, remember, on the boiler system before? 
the two pipes that has the, the furnace in here has the pump and it's pumping on one of these pipes and the oil is coming in the other. So it's a circle and this is going uphill. The problem is because there's uh, soil all around the tank and there's moisture, water laying on the top, these things will age and rust and start leaking extremely, I don't want to say extremely fast, I'm sure the ones that they now, use. Now there's a, there's a remediation company because I had an issue with the buried oil tank which realtors don't feel it's a, it's a big deal, but that's for another story. What ends up happening is that, that metal is only rated for a certain duration of time because you have galvanic corrosion due to water and the metals and the dirt. Galvanic? Yeah, because there's different, the, the dirt has metals in it. Yeah, so it'll start, it'll start corroding and also you'll get water in the tank too. So one of the things that you definitely don't want anyone to do is they do what is called pressure tests. You don't want to ever want to do a pressure test. Also, when you do the samples, you have to get the samples underneath the tank because mm -hmm. oil doesn't flow up. Excellent ex uh, thing because when I used to, I had a, the, <coughs> we had a laboratory here in the area that did the, uh, up in Clifton Park down the street from where I live and I got to know the owner of that company and he, it cost a thousand dollars for him to do the, the testing because he uh, exposed the top half. And then he could get one of his guys in the hole and run and get his sample from directly, and he did a couple of samples, directly underneath it. Yeah. Because if you're doing it from up here, you do not know where in relationship to that tank you're taking your samples. So, his quote always had, listen, to properly test this tank, I got to remove this tank. And let's find out now if we have an EPA. So he says in, this, in, in his quote, he, he will properly test the soil and he will remove the tank. Now quotes I got, if there are no issues with the dirt, it's approximately $3,000. Just to get rid. They're not replacing it. No, to get rid of it, remediate, well, however you want it. That's right. right. To get rid of a, a non-leaking tank, about three thousand. Three thousand, and you don't. I had one that happened to me in Greenwich, and it was my first leaking oil tank. And he went out there and he uncovered it, and it was leaking. And when the EP and he had to legally report it, and when he was done with it, State Farm wound up wound up spending thirty-five thousand dollars. And the only reason I want to caution you about this. The only reason is he was smart enough to know the system and this report of the leaky soil has to come, or the t contaminated soil has to come from the testing laboratory, his laboratory. If the client reports a leaky oil tank to the owner of the house, reports a leaky oil tank that's contaminated the soil to the insurance company. For a claim, there are riders on the policy that that exclude soil contamination from pollutants. But the, the insurance companies have to pay if it's coming through the channel channels of a testing laboratory. So the first thing that you want to do is advise your client: don't just call the insurance company. Talk to one of these remediate uh, testing laboratories that will test it and have them report it. Now I can't see the problem at all as to whether that's just hearsay or it's not always that fact. Having the company report it to the EPA seems to me the proper way to go about it. It just makes common sense. You calling your insurance company and you making the claim, uh, there are supposed to be, from what I've heard, uh, there are clauses in there that eliminate the, their payment of any funds. But the um, State Farm wound up paying a $35,000 check to get rid of his tank. The problem with this, how much do you know, Joe, that that uh, test cost that didn't uncover the tank? 400 500 bucks? For the oil samples? Just the soil the samples. The soil samples? It, it, yeah. I. I didn't ask them and I wish I did. It, it makes sense that they remove the top so they can get underneath because they must have some sort of wand that defines the space and then they must have 
like they got to be able to understand like how but, deep to but go. But it's under the steel, uh, and how? The, yeah, they're probably mathematically could, they could get there, but I'm sure I can get two thirty dollar an hour guys to uncover half this tank in about two hours. What's it going to cost? One hundred twenty bucks? Yeah, I mean the agents are like, hey, in our area, there's a lot of buried oil tanks. We, yeah, we don't see it as a big deal, and I'm like. The reason why this is a big deal, it's the only defect that can impact the environment and your neighbor. Mold doesn't impact the, the how, you know, your neighbors. Uh, foundations don't impact your neighbors, but this is the only thing that can impact your neighbor. Lewis, is that the one you came up with? Yeah, I, yeah I completely stole it. Uh, I was just, we remember, <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> a, month later, a month later, we couldn't remember what it was. That yeah, and that's what it was. It impacts your neighbor. It impacts your neighbor. That was my one epiphany for the year. Enjoy it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's almost a new year. You're good to go for another one. Yeah. Um, it, that, and that's absolutely true. Uh, this can impact the environment, people downhill, your neighbor downstream, your neighbors, everybody. That's why it's such a big deal. I've seen people have bought houses near gas gas stations also that it's gone down three or four properties that the, the ground had to be removed and remediated. So you know this empty property up here at exit 10 right across from the Hess station. That's a real nice building. I've been thinking about buying it uh, to put the school into. It's great. It's got a big open works area uh, like a uh, automobiles, it, it may have been, you know, it, oh, it was oh, a, the, the used auto sale yeah. place. No, was that an auto sale? Yeah. Or it, I thought it was a, 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 a transportation, a department, a department of transportation or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, right at, at exit yeah. 10? Yeah. Oh, exit 10. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it used to be like an old, uh, the, the big uh, block building. Yes. It, it used to be an old tool and dive manufacturer way back in the day. Yeah. It's a great building, yeah. great location, yeah. everything. I had pictures of us buying that and putting the school in it. Guess why I now found out just this last weekend. I had a friend of mine uh, that is a realtor, and we were looking at that property, and we pulled up to it, and and I says, wouldn't this be great to move the school here? I could put a couple of my, both my companies into it. This is great. It's been here forever. And she looked at the door and said, well, it's not going to sell. I said, why is that? Because there's hazardous material signs on the door. And if it's been unsold for at least the 15 years I've been here, yeah. oh. <laughs> it's not going anywhere because nobody wants to pay to have the money yeah. to have not only it tested properly. The amount of money they paid on taxes, they could be getting effects. So she's, that's not happening. You're not buying that. Unless you want to have all those battles, and that's the last thing I need. That's the headache I need is to buy buy a piece of property that has never concern. get to use. <laughs> never get to use. It took me a minute to figure out who he was talking about. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about. We did carbon monoxide testing, right? I, I walked through the whole thing in terms of how to do it. Uh, draft regulators on 281. Those are solely used for oil systems. If you see one on a furnace, you want to write it up. And if you don't see one on an oil system, you want to write it up. Here's your boiler. Here's the heat exchanger. Here's your pipes going up. Here's your flume. In this flume is a thermal uh, damper. What's the technical term for, for this, Joe? Image of a draft regulator. Okay, draft regulator. In the side of this pipe, the reason why it's used on oil and not on gas, and the reason why you need to be able to, to identify it and call it out is when you're build, burning oil, the oil flames are significantly higher than gas flames in temperature, which this higher temperature oil flame creates a much stronger draft. And if this isn't there, this draft 
can, in certain situations, blow these flames out and cause a problem. Your house will freeze over. So, you need to create, a, a, you need to install a damper, and that's why they have these graph regulators in there, that as the speed of the air starts rushing through this, it will, it will open up wider to reduce the draw so that it's taking air in here and now there's not as much draw effect that the, basically the velocity of the combustion, uh, the makeup air going into this, it reduces so it doesn't blow the flame up. Also, it helps uh, dilute the gases, the, the gas temperatures, so it doesn't damage the chimney, depending on... I've never heard of that. Yeah, that was one of the line items that uh, I saw. I mean... <clears throat> that they're, uh, well, the, the main reason the draft regulator was created was to reduce the, uh, the, blow, the, the pull of the air over the flames mm -hmm. so that it wouldn't blow the flame out. The gas system doesn't need it because this doesn't burn as hot, notice the shorter lines, so the air will casually work its way through and out, and that flame stays intact. But oil burns at such a, high, uh, such a higher temperature that it creates more of a draft, which has the uh, 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 possibility of, of uh, blowing the flame out. Why would you pull it out in a gas? <coughs> because now you're having an open hole up here that's going to leak, could leak carbon monoxide out into the room. Yes, it's not going to hurt the blow, but now I have an open in my seal line, and now I'm going to have carbon monoxide going into the room. So if I have it in a gas line I'm uh, because of carbon monoxide, I'm going to write it up. And if I don't have it in an oil system, I'm going to say the possibility of the system distinguish, extinguishing itself because of uh, makeup air speed um, would um, um, cause the unit to fail. If you're not home, the house gets cold, the house freezes over. Carbon dioxide, or carbon monoxide rather, is a function of incomplete combustion, right? I believe so. Yeah, so would that be, you know, with the higher oil temperature, no, I think there's more, it would be more of a complete combustion at the higher temperature. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. And so you'd have less of a uh, problem with carbon monoxide. The carbon problem. monoxide isn't my issue. I, I understand. The carbon monoxide leak here is only an issue with the gas. Oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. Because that's going to be that. there. That's going to be there. If it's a gas system, that's uh -huh. bad. Yes. With an oil system, it's not yes. bad. Okay. So would you get a carbon monoxide leak with the oil, with, you know, proper oil system with that? The draft is such a speed it shouldn't spill into the roof. Okay. And you know how drafts work. Once you get that pull going, it's not, it's as it decided to meander around. Okay. And it's going at such a higher rate that they're trying to reduce that rate. I've, I've measured carbon monoxide, ambient carbon monoxide around this area, and with an uh, oil system, put my carbon monoxide meter here, that wind is open, that, that damper is open, the system is firing full speed and I haven't read anything. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> I efficiency <I'm> units. <laughs> Pardon? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, I was just talking about it. was mine. High efficiency unit. Who wants to, uh, of course everybody's reading the books, there's no, used to be nobody would read the book and I'd get to go around and find out who was the idiot. Getting late. <laughs> we got a whole other lesson to go. Just leaves you. Um, high efficiency unit has two heat exchangers. This improves the efficiency of the system in the way that they measure efficiency. I'm going to burn, and uh, heat. Uh, I'm going to burn here, and the heat from this 
is going to then be used for in a second burn. And so I'm, it's more efficient in terms of um, less fuel. I'm using the heat from this box generated to even heat more. So I'm using less full fuel for double the heat. And the second thing, so this is more efficient from a fuel perspective. That's why they call them high efficiency. Here's my uh, draft out. Here, oh, there's my, um, oh, okay, makeup there. And here's my heat. And these go out the side wall instead of the older system would go up through the roof, the chimney, from the basement, here's your house. So I have this, in this unit, the gases went out here, and in the high efficiency unit, they're going out the side of the house, which then eliminates the need to build the chimney. Now, is that only available in furnace? Boiler, oh, furnace and boiler. Both. Both. Good question. But why can't the high efficiency go up there if there's an existing chimney? There can, and I've seen it done that way. And I've gone down the house, and I see this PVC pipe, the chimney. Yeah, I'm down the road, and I see the house, and I see the real estate sign out front. And I'm driving down the house, and I always look at the roof from the road as I'm driving up to it, just to get an idea of what I could see from a distance, and I looked at the chimney, and there was at least five foot of PVC sticking up through the chimney, and, and um, that's another issue. So the chimney ended here, and there was another five foot of white PVC. Uh, so we can do that if they want, but there's no reason to build it into the system nowadays because everybody's using the high efficiency which goes out the side of the house. The question is, why is it okay now to go outside of the house when it wasn't uh, okay on the older non-efficient system? Or remember, high efficiency is defined by two heat exchangers, not by where the pipes, ex pipes uh, uh, exit the house. It's because there's two heat, uh, heat exchangers is what makes it high efficiency, because they're talking about fuel efficiency. One of the byproducts is, is uh, that you can now plumb your exhaust out the side of the house and not through the roof. Any guesses as to why? More complete burn. Well, it's, it's lower temperatures. Uh, did you read that? Or was, did no, I'm just guessing, because I've seen it on uh, hot water tanks, too, with the, the same Right. Um, it, it, that's exactly right. These exhaust gases are a couple hundred degrees. I'm just picking numbers. I don't know what it is. But it's too hot to have round children playing in the yard. This is at 80, 90, or 100. There's a 100 different degree spread between the two. Now when you go outside and your furnace is on, and you can go out and hold your hand there and you can feel warm air coming down. That would be the equivalent of going up there and holding it out and you'd burn your hand. So because it's now safe, because the temperatures of the exhaust gases are so much lower, it is now safe to have those pipes run out the side of the house instead of having it go up here where nobody can get hurt. But remember, high efficiency systems are not defined by where the pipes escape. And these pipes, one of them is exhaust. Going out. And one of them is the makeup air or combustion air coming in. So you have your, your air coming down for your burn supplied here. And then your exhaust going up here. OK? So this is two pipes, one is exhaust, one is makeup air, and the defining factor on this, uh, or the byproduct of being a high efficiency unit, is the uh, lower temperature of your exhaust gases. Okay? Now, there are combinations of this. The typical thing you will see is just one pipe 
if it's not the two pipe system, it's one pipe, same high efficiency unit, but just an open hole up here, and they're using the general interior basement air for your burn instead of the outside air. Hmm. Now that is considered less efficient, but still keeps its high efficiency uh, label. It's less efficient because that makeup air isn't as cold as the outside air. I, I believe that the temperature of the makeup air will help affect a higher temperature burn, which will then heat uh, the air to a hotter temperature. Um, and so it reduces the efficiency of not having the two pipes. So when you walk into a system and you see the exhaust pipe going out and going out the side of the house and you look at the unit and there's just a hole at the top, they're just using the interior air for its combustion air. And these are always gas? No. Fire? Oil. Two. They're, the oil high efficiency systems are less common but I think that's because oil is less common, mm -hmm. at least in my area. Yeah. Can they be like hybrids, like not necessarily like just that, like it can be oil and burners or like that, or you haven't seen anything like that? Like two, two different like, I guess two different systems into like one versus just like two furnaces, hypothetically speaking. I'm totally lost. So usually it's the, the high efficiency. It's, it's basically, you can look at it this way, that it's two furnaces in one. Okay. Okay. I got that. So can it be like no. a boiler and a furnace in one? No. So it'll be just... You have one media that you're heating the house with. You're either heating it with water or air. Okay. If you want to do two systems in the same house, and I see that, I'll see the older portion of the house done in boilers and I got radiator baseboard convectors around, and then they put on an addition on the back, and they put it in a new master bathroom, and they got the whole thing, and they did that with furnace. Pardon? Because they want central air. Yeah, because they want central air in the master bedroom. They held the kids in the front bedrooms. Mama's got to have her cold air. That's what I always said. <laughs> what? So I always said, the hell with the kids in the front bedroom. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So if you're going to have a hybrid system, and you have a hydrum, Hi, uh, a hybrid heating system in the house and you're going to have one boiler and one furnace. That is doable. And that you see when they'll build, because exactly like he said, because they want air, they'll take their house. Because if you have a radiator system, if you have a radiator, you wind up with um, a water and you can't now air condition it unless you do a whole separate. So when they built the new unit, they just went with a whole new furnace, and then they could put air in that. And then on the other part of the house, they just used window ACs. There's different types of pipes. <clears throat> Two pipes going out the side of the house is typical. This pipe going up. And this pipe going down is the more standard way these pipes should end. Any guesses as to which is which? The exhaust is up. I'm asking you guys a question. Everybody's reading the freaking book these days. There's no fun in this. I'm not enjoying teaching like I used to. Nobody bothered to used to read the book, so I got to play games with everybody's head. This is so. If you have it mixed wrong and you feel the air blowing out here, that's your exhaust leaving, which means this is going to rise because this is hot air and it's going to get sucked back into the system. Now you have carbon monoxide going back in, uh, which is going to reduce the effectiveness of the high efficiency portion of the system. It's still not going to contaminate the furnace air, because that's sealed air that's being circulated throughout the house, the sealed air that's being circulated, or the conditioned air that's circulated, isn't going to be contaminated by your exhaust gases. But what this is going to contaminate is the burn. And the, that carbon monoxide going into the burn is going to 
effectively reduce the efficiency of the system. Huh? So the orientation of these two pipes, like the picture on page 283 show, is important. I, you see all the, uh, this an awful lot. Two block pipes just ended like there. There's the house. Here's your fresh air makeup, and you're hoping the top one or the side one on the side, the hot air theoretically is going to go up. But if you create if these are side by side looking at you, and it's coming out, you're looking down the pipe, you could create such a draft here that these gases are started sucking in. I mean, they're naturally going to start to rise because hot air rises. But I wouldn't want to rule out the fact that, a, that the, the draw could be uh, back into the unit. Okay. Now the example on the bottom of the page is these two pipes merge together just before they go out the wall. And you'll see it join like this. And what that does become is an inner pipe. So now you have a cone outside. Here's your wall. Here's the one pipe you see, the dark line, and inside that's another one. And I believe the inner one is the exhaust. Yes. So if you look at the picture, the exhaust is the one coming out the front. The outer pipe is being filled from the air from behind that baffle, behind that cone. Okay? The last subject to talk about this is that first house I told you about, where as I drove up to the house, I could see this pipe going out the chimney. So here's a house. Here was the chimney going down into the basement. Here's my unit. Here's my exhaust line that ran along the basement. And trust me, it was at the other end of the basement and then all the way up to the roof. I, and I called, as soon as I saw this, I called my heating and cooling expert. I've got a basic measurement on this. <coughs> the thing that bothered me is they took the fresh air intake and brought it in from the side of the house which was five foot away from the, the wall where the furnace was. And they ran the full length of the basement and then up, which was 30 foot by probably 40 foot. So I had a 70 foot exhaust line and a five foot makeup air line. And that just felt wrong. I didn't know that it wasn't wrong. I just couldn't believe that that was okay. So I called my heating and cooling guy, and he, <coughs> he uh, told me that my instincts were right. It's wrong. The distance on those two pipes should be within about 10% of each other. So in other words, they have to be approximately close. If you've got a 10-foot run where it goes out the wall, you don't want it, one of them to go out a wall 10 foot away and the other to go out a 40 foot away. I told him about this chimney one going up through the chimney, and he's still laughing to this day. Um, why they would do that. They probably didn't want to poke through the wall because it was a brick structure, and they didn't at, he didn't have a supply or know about the cone one that went into just one projection. And so since he didn't want to poke two holes in the wall, he used the one for his makeup air and decided he'd use the chimney for the fluid. He ran it down there. Well, that is not, uh, a, uh, that's not, I don't want to say it aloud, that's not recommended by the manufacturer. It reduces the efficiency and life of the system. 
that in balance. It has to be within certain parameters. Okay, that was a lot of material. Any general questions on heating? What you mean by gas on gas again? Uh, that's a, a stove that's used in the kitchen in rental units. It is a way of providing in an apartment a heating system and a stove for cooking. So it meets code in the city because it's a heating system and it provides uh, the same gas line coming in to heat and to heat. So they call it gas on gas. Yes? Do you ever see wood burning boilers? Oh, don't start me on those. Don't start me on those. <laughs> Joe's shaking his head. Have you run into some? Yeah, usually it's the uh, outdoors that they were selling for a while, like, you know, like 10 years ago. Right. They were, they were popular back a ways. Yeah. And uh, I've seen homemade versions of them. Yeah, they that's had a boiler out in the garage. No, they had a fireplace out in the garage actually heating up, uh, uh, how was it? They were heating up water out the garage and using that water to run inside into the house. And when it got inside the house, they coiled it up and they had fans. And literally, he made his own furnace. Yeah, I had fans all inside with, the fans. with coils heated in the garage. I yeah. couldn't believe how inefficient this My was. My brother in law's father was, uh, he had the, the burning to create the heat and was pumping the water in and recycling it through. What you're going to find out is the, uh, the wood burning systems are typically used as uh, a primary system in, uh, for heat, but they always have a backup system behind them of a gas or electric makeup. So they'll have the wood burning will then bring the heat in and it'll, uh, it will uh, then either go into a gas or a boiler system but they will always have an electrical backup for it, or maybe a whole nother furnace, so that when the wood isn't being supplied, because let's say you're sick and you go to, don't go out and supply the wood into the system, uh, then uh, the, if that burner shuts down, another heating system works its way in. I gotta tell you, I looked at a house in North Red Alban that had a commercial wood oil uh, furnace in it, and you put the wood in <coughs> the furnace, and then at night, if that went out, the oil then, kicked the, in. then the oil burner kicked in. So it was just two burners on one unit? It was just, yeah, it was, it was a huge freaking thing. Yeah. You know, but, uh, huh. I've never seen that. I don't know if that's all that. Maybe yeah. you need dress. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's a good system. I'll stay in bed tomorrow. Say, I think I'll go up there. <laughs> Anything else on heating systems? Just remember, we're not experts on it. Don't try and know everything. It's either heating or it's not. Turn on the thermostat if it's working fine. Make sure you know how to write it up. Look at some of the defects. Um, okay, thanks. That's it.